industry of vast proportion. John Williams scores the uh, opening beautifully, and I think I made it known that John did this score basically in advance of the movie. We talked about it. He came down to the set in Dallas. He saw it, and he had very strong feelings on John Kennedy. This was the second time we had worked together after Born on the Fourth of July. John uh, just had a thing in his heart for Kennedy, and I think he poured it out here in this very uh, twisty opening theme, which is the combination of the Kennedy theme, the trumpets, the glory, the dignity, the, the hope. We started, of course, right with Eisenhower. I think that was the smartest thing I could have done. Black and white, 16 millimeter. It was just a weird little moment in his farewell address, but it gets right to the point. And in hindsight, it's far clearer now than it was at the time. Now, what he actually meant will be debated by historical scholars for years. Over the vice president, Richard Nixon, by a little more than 100,000 votes. You hear Martin Sheen's voice during the voiceover, and we cut to a montage of images that we created that we felt represented the thinking of the time. Be devoted to the cause of freedom around the world. You saw briefly an image of a black man uh, being hung upside down. I believe that was Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. You saw images of Dulles and Kennedy together. I think that's very interesting, the look on their faces, the way they interact. You see Kennedy with Hoover. Now, those two didn't like each other too much either. Hoover had his own power source. And I'm not saying that Hoover and Dulles were in any way united. I think they probably had completely different objectives. But the FBI was certainly no friend uh, to uh, Robert Kennedy over at the Justice Department. In fact, uh, Hoover hated him more than uh, he probably hated Al Capone or, or Emma Goldman. Vietnam, Cuba, Russia. Remember those. Russia is the most important. I think you should also look to Kennedy's speech in 1963 at American University as a very defining moment for this man. A man who has made a sea change, as I said, in June 10, 63, he really came out there and said what was on his mind, and it was, uh, what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. We must re-examine our own attitudes towards the Soviet Union. We must make the world safe for diversity, for in the final analysis, our most basic link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. It's a beautiful statement made by perhaps one of the world's first planetarists. I mean, a man who's thinking in a planetary way about the, well, the issues that really matter, such as uh, well, the issues that we're facing now post-Cold War, which is all nationalism, and uh, while we avoid, uh, while we fight from country to country like silly children, the planet goes to a greenhouse effect, carbon dioxide is released, and we seem to be burning up this planet. I don't understand it. Kennedy seemed to be a man who was too far ahead of his time and was killed for it. One very interesting uh, dramatic technique we put in here was to cut into the documentary with Rose Sharami, played by Sally Kirkland. That's a stage scene also, but it's based very much on a true facts. She was a uh, woman of low repute, so to speak, in the, in, the, in, the, in the parlance of those days. And she was thrown out of a car by two of Jack Ruby's associates and made this very Cassandra-like announcement in the hospital to several people, including a police officer called Francis Frug. I love the way he switches uh, after the Rose Charami incident in the road, played by Sally Kirkland there. He switches to a very military edge and he just keeps that drum up all the way through to the shooting, implying a military connection. So I don't show the actual uh, hit until later in the film. I show it the way we sort of heard about it back then. I'm using, as you can see, uh, different stocks uh, early on. We're mixing uh, 16 millimeter Ike, Ike Eisenhower with home movies, eight millimeter with 35 beautiful black and white. A, th a softer, more muted 35-millimeter uh, uh, color is going to come into play here in New Orleans, and that will culminate the 1963 sequence. By 1967, you'll start to see a different color scheme emerge. You'll see Zapruder there, standing there with his camera. You see the girl in the red skirt. Uh, the shots rang out, as we were told they rang out. I only have three shots there. Uh, one witness told me that the shots were bizarre. There were almost echoes in a canyon but he remembers these pigeons flying off the top of the roof, and I just thought that was a very haunting image. And I can tell you that all hell broke loose in the next 10 minutes. There was so much going on all over the uh, Dallas, uh, New Orleans, Washington, the world. It is an amazing 10 minutes of time. 
why this shooting? Kevin Costner is the anchor to this film, the man who's going to take us through it, playing the real-life figure of U.S. District Attorney in New Orleans, Jim Garrison. Uh, in the script, I wrote, we sense the quiet intellect of the 43-year-old man. The clock ticks in the awful suspended silence. It's as if the air itself has been sucked from the silent room. This is the last moment of peace before the world will rush through the door in all its sound and fury to change his life forever. The camera haywires into a close-up of Jim as he looks up and knows. How bad? Lou Ivon, uh, his chief investigator, uh, Actually, uh, who came on the case later, it was actually Frank Klein at that time who later, who quit, who told Garrison, but uh, he resigned and from the office over a personal dispute. So I had to break down many of these uh, figures. As you know, a district attorney's office is always in turmoil, changeovers, and you know, it was basically a hardcore group that uh, went through the whole thing with Jim. Lou Ivon uh, joined and was very important, his sort of second, uh, and it was played by Jay Saunders here, a very good theater actor, and I thought it was a very fine performance. It's the moment we all stopped in our lives. We all probably remember where we were when Kennedy was killed. I wanted to drive that home with a shot of the clock and the sense of the air being sucked out of the room. I also wanted to show how we were held in thrall, all of us as a country, by the television for the next 48 hours over that whole weekend. But you also sense a divided opinion. Screaming at the bar where Jim is watching is Perry Russo himself, the uh, the real Perry Russo. He's played by Kevin Bacon in the film, but in, he, that is the real Perry Russo. And then his, his real feelings about Kennedy, which his motive for cooperating with Garrison, he later reveals to be, is he wants the investigation to reveal that Oswald, this wimp Oswald that we knew, was not responsible, that it was, in fact, a coup d'etat against somebody who everyone hated. He hated Kennedy. He was a right winger, Perry. You see uh, Bill Newman there. William Newman was always his good witness, and Garrison called him at the trial. He's being played by a younger uh, Vince D'Onofrio, who did a wonderful job. He looks quite a bit like Bill Newman, and Newman oh, never changed his story. He always thought the shots came from the fence right over his head. He ducked with his kids hit the sidewalk. As I said, most of the witnesses thought the shot came from the fence, and if you look at all the film, the Knicks film, all those films that were made, you will see all the movement, the main movement of the crowd is towards the knoll, towards the grassy knoll. It was a dream to get Asner and Jack Lemmon in the same scene. Asner, as you know, is a, uh, one of the most progressive actors in Hollywood, working very hard for many causes, for many people. He was once the president of SAG and uh, Screen Actors Guild. You see real witnesses. Those are real witnesses intercut with people like Vince D'Onofrio, uh, but uh, pretty much everybody else is the real witness at the time. Asner has been a fighter for the uh, underprivileged. It was funny to therefore that he played a right winger with an attitude. And Jack, of course, is the opposite, and, but we, and is wonderful, and actually looks a bit like the real Jack Martin, who was an alcoholic. Dallas police have just announced that they have a suspect in the killing of a Dallas police officer, uh, J.D. Tippett. There was much reason to believe at that time because Oswald allegedly had shot Officer Tippett, that he therefore was shot the president. It makes sense for him to kill a cop, but that is like, again, another fantasy from a G-Man movie because uh, there is plenty of uh, strange evidence in the Tippett slaying as to how many people actually killed him, which we'll discuss later. You notice there was a fractured edit on Oswald getting into the car at the theater. A very interesting moment, which is going to pay off later in the film. It's one of the cutting techniques we started to use here, like little blips, blips uh, of consciousness that would hit, subconsciousness almost, that would hit Jim Garris. I love the scene with Asner and Lemon. I think his, their timing is two drunks is great. Especially Ed's look when he realizes that Jack has said, I saw so many strange things in this office. And he says, what do you mean strange things? Guy Bannister is a uh, very interesting and uh, important player in this uh, New Orleans sector of the story because it was a, a former FBI agent with very strong right-wing leanings, and after he retired from the FBI, ran a private investigation agency. He didn't spend a lot of time doing that, investigating, let people like Jack Lemmon, and uh, who's playing Jack Martin, and Dave Lewis do that for him. But he was very interested in his right-wing uh, espionage work, which he had huge files of everything from Cubans uh, 
down to weapons sales to uh, he was very he was very fond of uh, in, infiltrating student rallies breaking them up if they were liberal or leftist he would pay people like Ron Lewis Ron was a little runner around town who knew Louis Oswald very well he'd play people like Oswald and Lewis to go to some rally and break it up or heckle uh, he, he was very political Bannister and very connected in New Orleans he knew people uh, like Clay Shaw and he knew David Ferry David Ferry was spotted in the office many times during the uh, summer in which they were in New Orleans when they were fighting against Castro arming there was arms coming through the office in the street there were as described by Jack Martin who sat, saw it and saw David Ferry there during this uh, gunplay when Bannister bops him on the head uh, Jack actually got hit on the head because uh, it, was pretty, it was pretty tough work and he went, plunged right back into the action, no complaints when maybe he had a headache the next day. They have taken me in because of the fact I have lived in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. That's a real dialogue from what he said in the hallways. Uh, I had nothing to do with the murder and he says, I am just a patsy. He denied it to the very end until he was killed on Sunday and if he had ever gone to trial, I'm sure Oswald had some confidence that he'd make it to a trial. Perhaps that's why he was so cool, and Garrison noted how cool he was. He wasn't, fr he wasn't rattled. Murdering a policeman. Elizabeth was a very, uh, very Southern woman of the time, and I think Sissy played her to a T. You saw Jack Ruby briefly filtered into the Oswald press conference. In reality, he was not at the press conference there, but he was at, weirdly at the press conference with Henry Wade later in the day and corrected Wade on the pronunciation of the fair play for... Cuba committee. So Ruby was definitely around the police station, had friends there, was a bag man for the mob, had run guns to Cuba, and was bizarrely around the edges. And how he got into the garage to kill uh, Lee Harvey Oswald remains, will, and will always remain a great mystery, with 70 policemen around him. He spent last summer in New Orleans. Sissy Spacek, to me, uh, in playing Liz Garrison, very much resembled her as a conformist in her thinking, very much the average, the national average, uh, the perception of Oswald immediately as a ugly little fellow with strange uh, leanings was accepted by most people. A woman who was very proud to be a, a southern housewife, raising five or six kids, and being uh, her husband's supporter. Unfortunately, she couldn't remain her husband's supporter. They divorced after the events depicted in the movie were over, and uh, Jim uh, remarried. Without any doubt, he's the killer. The law says beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty. Henry Wade's statement at the end of this scene is outrageous, as you can see, and it only confirms the fact that the decision that Oswald was the guilty party was determined in the first 72 hours. Ferry was a known character around Dallas, believe me. And he was proud of his world war record, World War II. He trained his uh, kids, civilian pilots, in the Civil Air Patrol. And Oswald was one of them. Nine people have made that match between Oswald and Ferry. And Ferry was everywhere. He was pictured with, uh, with Clay Shaw at a party. You know, he was part of the underground. I mean, the guy liked partying. He liked boys, and he liked, uh, I think, uh, ultimately men. You know, But that wasn't the issue. The point is that's how he got to meet and fell into that shadow with Clay Bertrand, who was Clay Shaw, because they both played in the same rough underworld that was uh, New Orleans, and it was a limited underworld. The TV killing uh, was one of the great moments of, or worst moments of American history. It was the something from the emperors of Rome, <laughs> where you see the emperor assassinated before your own eyes. This was the first uh, live killing on television that ever occurred, to the best of my knowledge. We had the photograph in Vietnam shortly thereafter in 68 Tet Offensive of the uh, South Vietnamese police colonel blowing the brains out of the uh, VC uh, infiltrator in Saigon, which shocked the American public. But this was the first TV killing, as far as I know. And it's astounding that uh, Ruby was able to get into one of the most high-profile prisoners of, of, of all time and kill him so easily, lunging towards him with one on. How did he get into the uh, police garage? He had been friends with the cops. There were many crooked cops, true. There was the uh, concept of the Dallas ma Mafia. But this is so strange. I wanted to make the point early that LBJ, on the day of the funeral when Oswald was being shot, was going about business with his top military chiefs. And he was saying, as the announcer said, we are dedicate rededicating ourselves to Vietnam. Now, this would seem to be the continuation of Kennedy's policies, but it is most definitely not. 
the National Security Action Memorandum that was composed the following day, in the following days, uh, NSAM 273, very clearly differentiates in its tone and its aggressiveness uh, policy of uh, commitment to Vietnam. Whereas if you go back to the National Security Action Memorandum 263, which Kennedy signed on uh, October 11th, you'll find the verbiage significantly different. The 273 Johnson document never refers to the 263 document, which is very interesting. It refers only to the October 3rd memorandum, seven days earlier, eight days earlier, uh, drawn up by McNamara and Taylor after their visit to Vietnam, which was much weaker in language in their suggestions to the president. It was the president who stiffened the language and made it very clear that he wanted his America out in the 263. This was buried from the American public. I love the uh, Ferry, David Ferry dialogue. It's, uh, and Joe Pesci's performance is just impeccable. Ferry was a genius in many ways, a very strange man by all accounts. A mesmerizing effect on young boys uh, who, who were struck by his combination of anger and authority. Garrison, who has a wonderful memory, writes the scene from, uh, from memory and with dry humor, which is, I would say, a characteristic of Garrison. It's a very funny scene, as you can see. Garrison describes uh, Ferry as becoming more and more nervous, smoking more and more cigarettes, and coming up with crazier reasons for the goose hunt and for the ice skating rink that he wanted to build in New Orleans. So he had to go see the ice skating rink in Houston. I didn't get that one. In a storm. And you can see we layer in the storm. It's just sort of a nice layer. This is what we continually start to do in this movie. We break down. We, we, break, we deconstruct reality. We show you the storm. We show you, we, we, you, you get a feeling that there's layers of life going on. But uh, you couldn't approach him. A wise bunch of birds. Wise bunch of birds. A wise bunch of birds was, came right out of his mouth. What part? Perhaps my favorite line is when Joe Pesci scratches his ear and he says, what part? Uh, what part of the story don't you believe? I think that's just one of the great lines in the movie. And as the scene ends, this moment, this time period ends with John Jr. saluting his father, which is now made far more poignant by John Jr.'s premature death in a plane accident. This afternoon, the FBI released David W. Ferry of New The uh, FBI quickly released Ferry, and in a very bizarre uh, announcement, and uh, blamed it on the DA. That is not done in law enforcement. You just release the individual. But to single out Garrison was a strange way of uh, doing it, as if almost uh, they wanted to keep a distance from Ferry. Garrison accepted the, uh, the conclusion and went about, as, as I said earlier, cleaning up New Orleans. That's, that was his mandate, and he did a hell of a job pissing every, a lot of the main people off in power in, in New Orleans. He did not really think much about the case until he met Senator Russell Long about three years later on an airplane. They were traveling together, and Long, who was... Uh, one of the leading senators respected in the South, the son of Huey Long. Long made it very clear that uh, he did not believe the findings of the Warren Commission, as did uh, many other people in the country. In keeping with that sort of idea of a, a new dawn beginning, a new spring, the colors shift in the movie to uh, beautiful cherry blossoms of Washington, D.C. They're famous, and in fact, they're so famous that I forced myself to go back and do uh, Bob Bergeson to do a second unit shot several months before we were supposed to shoot just to get that first blossom. And it's a beautiful shot with a plane going through. And then you cut upstairs to see guess who? Walter Matthau, who's one of those guys who's really intense in the sense that he really focuses you on his story quickly and well. Uh, and like uh, Jack Lemmon and Ed Asner, uh, just shoots the story forward for me. Playing a scene that really happened between him and the district attorney of New Orleans. Walter was an old-timer, and, you know, he just came in on his due date on the call sheet, sat down, didn't bother anybody, nobody noticed him, and walking around, and people finally noticed him and said, there's Walter Matthau, you know, because of call time on the stage with such and such. Kevin walks in, and he sits down in the seat next to Walter. Walter doesn't know who he is. It was very funny. <laughs> and uh, that was sort of Walter. He was a crusty, funny guy. And he had uh, uh, Kevin and him were in stitches uh, most of the afternoon on this very claustrophobic plane we shot on a set somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in Somewhereville. Although it's 1967, the Vietnam War is raging. You see it in the paper. You see dark shadows across Matthau's face and across Costner's face. The plane has got a corrupt yellow air to it as well. Coming off the long shot of the corridor of the Justice Department, it's a cold blue to a corrupt yellow. 
think there were other men involved. I think that Walter Matthau is playing the character sort of drunk, and I think it's important that he be uh, uh, loose-tongued enough after having drunk, like a good Southerner, might talk a little bit about some of his own opinions to a man he trusted in Jim Garrison. To see uh, Spacek is, I think, perfect in her timing. She's a girl from Texas. She's very sharp. She's very sharp in that housewife way of the 50s. Very beautiful. Looks a bit like Elizabeth uh, Garrison. Uh, five kids, eventually. And she has a way with her husband. She's certainly uh, second position, and she accepts the hierarchical structure of the clan. But she's very wry, uh, especially when she says things like, isn't the uh, district attorney of New Orleans a little out of his domain? It's just a little uh, needle she puts in there. My son Sean is playing Jasper, uh, very shy. It's nice to have a baby album of your kids growing up. I love my E.T. shot. Uh, I call it my E.T. shot because we put the girl watching the TV in this sci-fi blue light, and then we drifted past her to the uh, dining room table where you see uh, you've, gotten a, you've gotten a chunk of the dialogue out of the way as you develop this southern scene. Uh, Saturday night, where, where Sissy and Kevin are making a date, so to speak, that Kevin never lives up to. He prefers his books. As I said, once you go into that rabbit hole, it never ends. It's, it's Alice in Wonderland. And it will be layer upon layer upon layer. And reality will become very murky. So also, Jim was uh, happily married. Uh, and now his whole life is disrupted. He starts reading the 26 volumes. He reads the attendant commission documents that were not published in the report. And it starts to rethink David Ferry's oddly timed trip to Texas. And uh, in investigating all the individual, individual testimonies, he began to become very bothered by the fact that so much of that testimony was not, either not in the report or it was uh, just in there, but there was no follow-up, there was no serious questioning of these people. Now, that included the testimony of people like uh, Bill Newman, for example, who you saw in the movie. Bob Richardson experimented, and I think very successfully, with the lighting shifts in this scene on uh, Garrison reading the Warren Commission over a period of weeks. He was an avaricious uh, reader, Jim, and soon got through it, and his mind uh, was just detonated, I think, into about 188 questions. What appeared in the report was uh, also very different from the Warren Commission documents, which have the exact interview. So, you, you know, do you get access to those documents? Bowers uh, is being uh, questioned by the Warren Commission here. Joseph Smith, a police officer who'd been a motorcycle escort, came, ran up the high grade of the knoll. See, originally the Warren Commission documents uh, were materials that for no apparent reason were not included in the Commission's 26 volumes that was published in uh, 24 September 1964. Lee Bowers, uh, played by Pruitt Taylor Vince, is, is a key figure uh, as the switchman for the railroad yard. You know, he had a box seat on the whole thing and saw as he describes in the film exact testimony, what he saw. So Bob, I think, did an interesting early, you see in his shifting of the lights, the fades, the sense of, a, of another layer of time. He creates a, a little world there that's beautiful. And I think the cold, icy photography of the uh, Warren Commission investigation rooms and the faces and the cigarettes and the nerves and the lack of the, the prosecutors were bizarre. The lawyers for the Warren Commission were really weird people. Liebenthal and Bellin and these type of people, they did not ask the right questions and that's what's frustrating to uh, Jim Garrison. There's also a shot from uh, Bowers' point of view, if you look closely, uh, it's very, hard, very nicely done, I think, in subliminal black and white of the shooter, potential possible shooter, uh, in a Dallas police uniform moving away from the fence. Bowers uh, was mysteriously killed in a very freak accident in Texas uh, a couple of years later. We tried to create a sense of uh, Rashomon illusion. It, it's so difficult, uh, as, you, as anyone who's been in panicked situations realizes, to really be that conscious and, and uh, all-seeing during a moment like this. It's all a glance at best. So what we tried to recreate what Bowers saw and certainly took a liberty in showing that the Dallas police officer. So uh, that kind of a liberty is, is uh, what I'm often criticized for, but I don't use it very often. But it certainly was Jim's uh, theory, that uh, one of his uh, suppositions that uh, it was done from the fence, and he was not the only one who feels that way. And many people have talked through the years about a police uniform or a Secret Service uh, outfit now. This is a very murky area that would take 
uh, half a book to solve, but uh, we went with the police uniform because uh, it would stand out much more dramatically, and that doesn't mean that the cop did it. The cop could easily be one of the many cops that were wandering around in this kind of frenzied situation. For the record, eight witnesses uh, in the Warren Commission hearings reported seeing a puff of smoke rising in front of the trees. Frank Riley, Nolan Potter, Austin Miller, James Simmons, Clement Johnson, Richard Dodd, Walter Winborn, and Tom Murphy. Patrolman Joe Smith ran up the incline. He, he was sure that the shots had coming up there. And then we had that great S.M. Holland, the old man, signal supervisor, who really uh, held his ground, it was very strong. Four shots, puff of smoke. The uh, walk through the uh, 50, 544 Camp Street and 531 Lafayette Street, it's the true buildings that existed. And, and we, you see how the buildings uh, bleed right in one into the other. It's an interesting concept that few people understand unless they actually see it in 3D. But uh, it, Oswald is definitely working inside that building. He's seen with a banister many times by many different witnesses, uh, including Jack Martin, who testified to, who was an investigator in his office, and David Lewis, who was also an investigator in Banister's office, saw him in there. Uh, numerous, numerous spotting to them. But I thought it was interesting, uh, because all oh, there's so much exposition here, uh, one way to get around it is, keep, you know, these issues of exposition keep coming up, and so we, we, we're telling it in a way we think it's exciting, so that you would see the ghost of Bannister emerge uh, from the building, although he's dead, and you see the ghost of Lee Harvey Oswald, also dead, emerge from the building. Uh, it's very powerful moments for me. The whole Canal Street incident's a very uh, strange one, uh, with Oswald sort of setting it up, uh, going and antagonizing Bringer, telling him, uh, working him up and then uh, pretending to be a, a anti-communist and then he goes out and he publicly pickets as a pro-communist which brings Brangier's wrath down on him but you must realize that television cameras arrive from the TV station a few minutes before Brangier shows up as if they're a little too early for the event and Brangier shows up and the fight is done in this sort of superficial manner and Oswald is arrested, Brangier is released Oswald's identity is established as a communist on the police file. The first thing up on the national TV screens will be him uh, debating and defending, uh, poorly by the way, uh, communism against uh, uh, Carlos Bringier's angry anti-communist speech. You see, I thought it was a very funny moment. That's actual dialogue, by the way. Bringier, who I met uh, a few years ago when I went down there, he was still a pretty angry guy, and I had him played by uh, Tony Plana, one of my favorites from uh, Salvador who played Major Max, the insane uh, death squad leader. I love Tony in this, and he really worked on his Cuban accent. So Oswald's profile is being established. If you look closely uh, at the scene when uh, Oswald is handing out the Pro Castro pamphlets, you will see uh, the Clay Shaw figure appear directly behind him. It's a very strange incident. It did occur around uh, the uh, Shaw's office. Shaw actually appears in a film that was uh, photographed walking in the background past uh, Oswald into the building and noticing, I think briefly, looking down at Oswald. I love the theme, uh, Crossing the Park High, with the John Williams uh, music just ghosting in the, the crusade. The men are embarking on something that's going to have far heavier implications to their lives than they ever dreamed. Garrison contacted Jack Martin, who's by now even worse off alcoholic, but it was hardly a good witness for him, but still, Martin did tell him things, and there are more than uh, there are two meetings, I believe it was, as did David Lewis, the other investigator, and uh, it was known and it was described here. It was a chance to describe this wide-open gangster attitude of New Orleans in those years. It was very much like Saigon for me in the mid-60s, a wide-open town where you can do anything. It was a feeling of lawlessness, a feeling of freedom. One commentator from Oxford uh, wrote a wrote something about that. It was a very interesting comparison he drew for me to uh, something I wasn't aware of, but uh, this scene grows intense uh, between uh, the coffee, uh, the legs of the horse. He made me think of the uh, racetrack scene in Nixon. And again, the linkage between the horse, the eyes of the horse like a beast, the hooves, the innocence of it compared to Hoover's face and the, the beast again. So horses uh, twice now, it's funny, uh, figured in these patterns, with, uh, in these two political movies, you know, the horse race concept of life, which is pretty brutal.
Because a lot of Cubans, no as you know, uh, if from the recent Ilian Gonzalez affair, uh, and that's how many years later, are just were rabid, rabid and ferociously emotional in their hatred of Castro. And for that reason alone, were, had a, certainly a motive to kill and were able to kill. I, for various reasons, doubt that, uh, because uh, I just don't think the Cuban organization was strong enough, organized enough to handle a paramilitary operation on this size and order. This was a very well done, executed, planned, professional hit. Guns are illegally being stockpiled by the CIA in their secret war against Castro on the continental United States as well as in Guatemala. There's no question that I'm playing with the speculation in, in putting Oswald in one of the camps as one of the soldiers, but it was something I did, and there's no evidence of him having actually participated in the shootings, but he, uh, for all we know, could have come by there one day with Ferry and or not. But uh, I put it in, and I, and I think that's a dramatist's license. I don't feel it's out of character. The FBI shuts it down, but it's sort of with a wink. By the way, do you notice here, Jack Lemmon sort of pays off the uh, concept of the empty uh, file cabinet. Who, empty, who, who opened my files? Uh, Asner said before he slugged him earlier. And now you see why, that Jack Martin, in fact, had opened his files <laughs> to partake of his whiskey bottle that the Bannister kept in that file. So it's kind of a little touch, a nice human touch. I would like to say also about Jack Martin, this is something else in connection, when you see him in the office, and he did say to uh, Jim Garrison uh, definitely that Lee Harvey Oswald had been in that office. He never said, however, that Clay Shaw had been in that office, and I want to point that out because it's in the book, uh, and I'm not trying to, you know, we're not trying to conceal it, but uh, this, is a, this is a license we took. Why? There is no known connection in Garrison's book between Clay Shaw and Guy Bannister. No known connection. And Jack Martin never said that Shaw was in the office. But repeatedly implicit in this uh, book and in other books is the repeated sightings of Ferry, Oswald, and Bannister, and sometimes Shaw. And, of course, the many witnesses that knew these people. This was a relatively small world in uh, New Orleans, as it was in Dallas. It would be implicit. It's just implicit to the thinking person. These people knew of or probably knew each other. This scene also, like the previous one and, and the following one, uh, is another step along the path of discovery. But as we unpeel the onion, we also find there are layers of time. Each scene has layers within layers eventually. It becomes very interesting editing-wise, the choices, I think, and uh, the expositions that we show. But definitely, uh, Dean Andrews was a character around New Orleans who spoke the hip uh, jazz language like many New Orleans people do, and he did handle several cases for this Clay Bertrand. He never met uh, Clay Shaw. I took the license of showing the uh, meeting as a possible possibility. I mean, it's not, it, it may be apparent that uh, Andrews saw, met him, and we don't know that he didn't. But the fact is that Andrews was convicted uh, as a perjurer after the trial, Jim brought him to trial and nailed him. But uh, Dean Andrews is a key figure, as I said earlier, because on the day of the assassination, Clay Bertrand, with this haughty King's English voice, this uh, haughty uh, New Orleans voice, tells him uh, that Oswald is going to need a lawyer in Texas. And Andrews, uh, being a small-timer New Orleans uh, lawyer, uh, simply says, I don't want anything to do with it. But he does reveal his information to the FBI, who have come on to call on him for some whatever mysterious reason, because, and Garrison knows of it, and Garrison brings him in. I really look forward to working with John Candy because he'd been one of, one of the most hilarious comedians in our culture. And uh, I just thought it'd be great to work with him in a dramatic role. So uh, by that time, he was a big movie star and had, he owned uh, or partly owned one of the uh, Canadian baseball teams. He was a Canadian, so he was a huge baseball fan. And him and Kevin uh, got along famously because they shared the enthusiasm for baseball, as you know. So, uh, unfortunately, John, uh, you know, he was great. I mean, he was just great. He sweated. He was so nervous. He was like, actually like that character. I mean, he was nervous. Uh, he didn't really have that uh, innate feeling that he could do drama. He felt more like a comedian lost among these actors, and he was scared. 
Tommy Lee Jones, Gary Oldman, Kevin Costner. I mean, he, these were giants to him. You know, he was a, just a comedy guy, so he was really nervous. And he wind himself up. He was a big man, so he had to. Uh, he 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 lived with a lot of stress. You know, and I think that hurt, hurt him and killed him young. It was a real tragedy that he died so young. I loved working with him. He was very sweet, and I wish we could have had more of him in the movie. But I just loved Dean Andrews, and he brought him to life. The uh, Layers of time uh, work very well also in Angola here in the continuation of the hunt. Uh, Angola has always been a dream of mine to shoot in. It's the largest uh, prison in Louisiana, and I had run across it in 1980 uh, scouting another film and always wanted to return because it's one of the last few classic prisons where work, a work camp where uh, men are allowed to work outside, which is more humane in some ways than some of the horrible prisons I've seen with industrialized uh, insides. The guards, too, it's sort of an old system. And the, uh, you're seeing uh, prisoners, real prisoners, and real guards. This is the system as it was in 1991. And it's a record of a real time in prison, as was, by the way, Natural Born Killers in, its own in, in, uh, in Illinois in uh, 1993, in Stateville, Illinois prison. Yeah. Willie O'Keefe is a, a composite of uh, several homosexuals, primarily Perry Russo, who was very strong in his description of the story, both to the on, in testimony as well as to reporters, as well as to me many years later. A conviction, uh, much like Jim Garrison had, was in him. He was an honest man, although a, a very tragic man in some ways, because he was, like O'Keefe pictured here, as a right-wing uh, strong believer in anti-communism and Kennedy being a communist. And this... Uh, tirade, uh, this anger I noticed in him in as late as 1991. He died a few years later after the movie, but he, this tirade in him was, the, was always there. He never, he never felt otherwise. Uh, he came from a belief, I think, and as many people have, uh, and it's true, perhaps, that Nietzsche was right, and the 20th, 20th century was about a will to power. Who rules, as Kevin Bacon said, who rules? It seems to be pretty evident in that world. When you get down to the bottom, as anybody knows, or near the bottom, you're going to find out that the question of who rules is pretty black and white and pretty clear. But incidentally, uh, the Clay uh, Bertrand uh, alias that Clay Shaw used in the quarter would be a common code name or, or alias for, for somebody of that stature, just because homosexuality was not uh, out of the closet, so to speak, in, in 1963, even in New Orleans or San Francisco, although in New York, although it was very evident that it was there, it was seen but not heard, so to speak. And uh, New Orleans, uh, certainly the French Quarter, also had a reputation because of its restoration and its housing and its uh, very artistic environment. It was a haven for the homosexual man. But at the trial, Garrison decided not to bring out uh, Clay Shaw's homosexuality. He did, not, he did not tamper on that because, uh, first of all, it would have been deeply embarrassing to Shaw, and he was trying to make the point uh, that the alias existed for whatever reasons it existed, but simply trying to make the point that Bertrand was Shaw. Thomas Millian was uh, working here in America at that time, and I used him as one of the Cubans, and you see him with a balding head uh, at various times in the movie. I call him the bull. I mean, he doesn't based on anybody in particular. It's just... Uh, I loved his face, and he was a wonderful man to work with. It's very rare that you're going to see uh, four actors uh, like that again in, in a scene. Gary Oldman and Tommy Lee Jones, Joe Pesci, and, and Kevin Bacon. They're all stars in their own right. And it's very hard you know, to put movies together now at the costs that we have of even getting four personalities like that in the same room. Very proud of it. it was, the dynamic was very sharp. The friction was there. It was not easy directing this. Uh, these are all very, very uh, demanding people. They want your concentration, and they deserve it. But it was uh, fascinating to watch uh, Pesci, and, and all of them were great. And uh, Tommy Lee uh, came, made, uh, made waves, as, as did Joe. And Gary was just quietly, quietly English and superb. And I think uh, it was perhaps underestimated, as he generally is. When Ferry goes on his final rant uh, against JFK, the ambush, uh, watch, uh, listen closely to the John Williams conspiratorial theme, which was the second theme he wrote after the JFK theme. So it's a very uh, tense piece of music. I think uh, 
uh, Bernard Herrmann would would even be proud, might be proud of that. Uh, and it, it, it reoccurs throughout the film. The will to power. Who rules? I think the uh, Kevin Bacon uh, situation, you know, reveals Jim's basic problem with the trial. Uh, you go to trial, and in the course of an, an, an life, uh, it's like the old man in the sea. You're trying to bring back the big fish, but all the sharks are eating at it. The, the trial was delayed endlessly, and many of the witnesses disappeared or were killed or refused to testify. Perry Russo was one of those who went all the way, and... Uh, of course, because he was willing to testify, uh, as were people like Vernon Bundy, they were just excoriated. Uh, in fact, Russo, who uh, was accused of being a drug addict, and uh, although he was a sadomasochistic man who, who openly admitted it to me, uh, his homosexuality and his love of sadomasochism, he uh, was a man who just said it like it was. You know, he was not he was one of those old-fashioned Americans. But the nature of witnesses is to be discredited, and as, as Jim would say, I don't know why it is that the, uh, the eyesight of a hooker has less moral input into the jury than that of a crooked lawyer with a, with a wide smile. Go ahead, you put me on the stand. I'll tell the same goddamn Kevin Bacon made a whole comeback from this uh, butch interpretation, which I, I find very funny and, and, and entertaining, too, at the same time as revealing. But uh, Bacon made a real uh, sp uh, jump into uh, more adult films as a result of this. In this uh, Antoine's uh, restaurant scene, which is a famous uh, restaurant in New Orleans, where Jim had lunches once in a while, and where he was well known in the town, very popular. Remember, he was a three-time elected uh, DA. And he had made an effort, really, to crack down on the corruption. He had taken on nine judges, went to the Supreme Court, on this, he went to the Supreme Court, and. He cleared out those nine judges, and that was because he wanted, basically, to clean out the corruption and bribery in, in uh, New Orleans, completely contrary, of course, to the reported image of and smearing of, of Garrison as a, as a corrupted DA, which is just not true. Hi, Susie. Hello. Susie Cox here, played by Laurie Metcalf, is, I guess, a, a bow in the direction of political correctness on my part because Jim's office basically had a revolving uh, group of uh, district attorneys and assistant district attorneys, all of whom were men. Uh, but I did this in the belief that uh, it was sort of tipping my hat, really, to the numerous amount of female researchers who, through the years, gave their lives for no money to pursue this case and bring it to the public attention. People, starting with Sylvia Marr, uh, so many citizens, not just women, men too, of course, gave uh, so much of their time and energy to uh, digging into the facts and uh, ignoring the uh, propaganda. The journalist that she talks about uh, is one of those people who show up in the Oswald drama constantly. She, uh, Macmillan got a contract to write Marina's Oswald's account of her marriage. These people, it's funny, the, when you start to think about the patterns, uh, you know, it really is like a Mission Impossible or something where all these people are not what they presume to be. Many of these people are actors. These people have, are playing a role in Oswald's life. Here is a journalist who, her name was Priscilla Johnson of the North American uh, Newspaper Alliance. She was one of the interviewees. And she, uh, you know, she didn't make too much of him. He was originally a Joe College with a slight Southern drawl. And then later, after the assassination, he became, quote, the stuff of which fanatics are made. And that, of course, was published widely. So here was Oswald saying, I'm a spy, <laughs> going over to the Soviets, uh, announcing it to the American embassy. He goes to the American embassy to the consul. He tells the two consuls there in one of the strangest scenes uh, that he is renouncing his citizenship and he's going to give the secrets away to the Soviets. The State Department guy thought that Oswald was, was, it was an act. He thought it was an act. He thought it was a pure act. He didn't believe a word of it. The other guy there was a CIA guy who uh, was there, I guess, just to make sure it went down and it was supervised. So what I tried to create in the mood and the atmosphere and the style of this movie is that sense of layers of mystery. Uh, frankly, I don't know all the answers. I, I have some clues and some, 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 obviously, some intuitions, but you sense always the music, the John Williams music, the constant uh, shifting of the frame to new imagery, the layers of time. It's the first time I'm really playing with time like that. Uh, it was a big step for me to do that, but it, was, it required the nature of the writing. It was such a big job. I loved it. Loved doing it. It was 
a labor of love, frankly. Uh, Zach was very helpful to me because uh, he had edited the original Garrison and was certainly helpful on the Garrison side of the story about the, the quirks, the way people acted. How Oswald managed to get a job at Jagger's Child Stovall, a photographic firm which you know, got contracts with the U.S. Army, uh, implies some form of security clearance. You know, What is Oswald, a defector, doing allowed to work here? I just don't understand. The guy who's playing the, his boss, by the way, in the scene is called Ron von Clausen, who is or was the real thing. He was one of the field guys, you know, in the Cuban stuff. He told me a lot of stories and uh, tough guy, really tough guy. I love the little things like the domestic, uh, innocent American house party given by Lee Oswald, all the Russians coming in with that music coming up and the worst um, horrible things are being said about Nazis and white Russians are coming into the house, you know. And all these people who visited the Oswalds are very political, believe me. De Morin Shield draws a picture of Oswald as... De Morin Shield's an old, sophisticated fascist going way back to the royalty days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. De Morin Shield was a character, a Russian character. In fact, the man who plays him in the movie, I'm jumping ahead, Willem Oltens is a friend of mine, uh, was a friend of mine, a Dutch journalist, who knew uh, De Morin Shield intimately. And what a story. The Dor De Morin Shield story is another one, because it was so bizarre. He really cared about Oswald, but in some ways he had to sell him out. He was the guy who pinned the rifle thing on him with the uh, Warren Commission, which saying that he had the rifle and he had fired shots at Walker, he thought, General Walker. And, you know, he, he, he was another one who buried uh, Lee. De Morinshield seems definitely to have been a handler because uh, a handler in the same sense that perhaps uh, Bannister was a handler or Shaw. I don't know if Shaw was a handler of Oswald. I don't know. But I certainly feel that De Morinshield was a handler in the, quote, agency sense of the word. He handles these lower cases. What happens is why does he put Oswald? He puts Oswald in a setting with white Russians, anti-communists, again. Oswald is not hanging around the, the real thing if he were at this dissident he talks about. You know, where he would be hanging out with communists. And I must point out that it was Ruth Payne who gets uh, Lee Oswald the job in the warehouse on the sixth floor. Ruth Payne uh, was one of those people who buried uh, also Oswald in the uh, public uh, eye, talking about that fight he had with his wife and calling him violent and abusive. But she, she didn't really know him very well, of course, because Marina moved in with them after it was clear that uh, Oswald could not support the family and wanted uh, and had to live alone on one of his secret missions that he was always going on and had to live in this boarding house under an other name. Marina must have thought he was nuts. But uh, they had children, two children, and they fought and they loved each other in their own way. He was a strange fellow, but he had some sort of morality. It was very clear to me. Very, it's very clear from his behavior he had morality. And I love the way that Gary Oldman in his performance suggested that morality. And one of the greatest scenes in the movie for me is the long shot of uh, Gary with the kids in the garden. I just love the lens. I love the feeling of him isolated with his children. And it's his, it's his last familial touch of warmth. You try to get to that essence of, of his heartbreak, the heartbreak of Lee Harvey Oswald. Here's a man who's been called the, the murderer for years. Nobody even bothers in the press to say the alleged murderer. He didn't have a trial. But uh, it must be, you know, what a weird karma to be Lee Harvey Oswald and to be called a murderer. Marina Oswald was immediately after the assassination ferried off to a, a uh, motel outside uh, Dallas in one of the suburbs and kept under federal custody uh, until the trial. She was uh, interviewed, she was prepared, uh, she was threatened right before the, uh, she was brought out again by immigration officials going back, to, uh, going back to Russia. She was a very frightened young woman who spoke like a robot when she was finally brought forth to confirm that Oswald was the killer. How she knew, uh, she could not have done. But no prints were ever made in a chain of evidence to that Karkana. There's a whole issue of nitrate prints on cheeks and hands, and, I, and you know, it's a long argument, get into it with a ballistics expert, but uh, what the FBI did was very bizarre, as if they took prints from the dead Oswald and put them back on the rifle. It was the stupidest buy of a rifle you could ever get, as uh, Jay Sanders says in the movie, Lou Ivon. Why, if you're going to shoot a president, don't you just walk into a store, get a rifle, and, sh and use that rifle instead of putting a P.O. box with an easy-to-find alias 
carrying a card around with your name and that alias on it and getting your getting the weapon that kills the president of the United States through that P.O. box. Even the stupidest Maxwell smart in the world, is, it wouldn't do that. It's, Oswald was not stupid. We talked to many people who'd been there that day. And frankly, when I read, 50-some of the witnesses heard the shot from the fence, saw puffs of smoke from the fence. 30-some saw, thought the shot came from the upper window. And 15 or 20 uh, did not know. Ellen McKeldiff, uh, she was a new actress at the time, but she had so much f fire in that accent. She's a fire plug and uh, came down from a theater, I think, in New York. And I uh, haven't seen or heard of her since, but my God, she was good. They're shooting, they're shooting, get out. Jeannie Hill was living in, in Dallas and was very helpful to us as uh, on the set with uh, giving us uh, her memory as best she could of where people were positioned and her own feelings about the uh, investigation that she went through. She was a, Jeannie Hill was a, a woman who's been also much maligned, like uh, Beverly Oliver, being set up really as a strong woman uh, by people uh, who claim that she's changed her testimony, this or that. It's just not true. She's uh, she's solid on it. She said the same thing basically through the years, uh, you know. And they always look for a slip up or something, and then they they say she's changed her testimony. It's like you know, it's it's insane. It's an insane denial. But Gene Hill just was basically one of the closest witnesses to his death. She was standing there with Mary Mormon, taking pictures. Clear as day, she saw the back of his brains blown out, the shot coming from the fence, the puff of smoke. She just said it all. Like you were from the Several corner. veterans, in fact. I remember uh, in researching the film, two, three veterans of World War II had been there that day and described the rifle fire as coming from definitely from the fence. Zapruder himself, the man, the Abraham Zapruder who took the film, when asked where the shooting came from, added, I also thought it came from back of me. Front and back, he was saying. I also thought it came from back of me. And even Forrest Sorrell, as a local Secret Service head, felt that the, the noise was coming in the direction of the knoll. According to the Warren Commission report, uh, no credible, quote, no credible evidence, unquote, suggests that the shots were fired from anywhere other than the book depository. In 1965, researcher Harold Fellman went through the commission volumes and found that out of 121 witnesses surveyed, 38 gave no opinion as to where the shots came from, 32 thought they came from the book depository, and 51 felt that the shots came from the Grassy Knoll area. Jean Hill was stopped by a man when she was chasing the guy. Which she, she didn't see the guy, but she was chasing a man running from the scene. I don't know who he was. She was stopped by a man who was wearing a business suit who held out his Secret Service identification. So there's a lot of Secret Service agents that aren't on the motorcade. It's very bizarre. Secret Service claimed that on the record that not a single one of its agents was at the scene of the assassination other than in the passing through the motorcade, which is where they were in the car, and all of them were gone right away. That means like two or three people who encountered Secret Service agents who claimed to be Secret Service agents encountered ghosts, I guess. I saw a man shooting from over there behind that fence. Jean Hill said that she was rudely treated right away as she was hauled off in front of these uh, investigators who were watching right over the square on the second or third story. It's amazing. They had the, 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 the cockpit seat. Now, whether the dialogue was that fast, you know, perhaps a little crude, crude in my writing, but, you know, I'm trying to get a huge amount of information quickly across. T.J. Kennedy was the investigator who was giving her the hard time. Probably that conversation, I don't know, may have taken 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but in a movie you have to do it fast, and it seems like they talk right to the point. And, she saw the man, she said, go towards the railroad tracks to the west. And then she was picked up by the uh, plainclothes officers who took her to the FBI. She was angry, though. But she was angry, Jean Hill, she told me. She was angry. And then she went later, uh, I don't know how much later, to meet that other guy who told her something like that, which really, uh, I mean, it seems like the angrier Jean would get, because Jean was so stubborn, the angrier they'd get. <laughs> you know, because she's that way still. She's a stubborn uh, woman. And she's a great woman. She, uh, she's she got a lot of conviction, a lot of backbone. Lolita Davidovich gives a wonderful performance, and I think we caught the flavor of Beverly Oliver's, the wistfulness, the, the madness, the fun. You know, you sense that she'd love to drink champagne and party. You know, she was in, she was a mall. She was in with the gangsters. She knew that world. One of those mysterious people you meet along the road of life. Uh, she was many things to many people, and she was quite a 
Mae West figure is the way I remember her from Dallas. She was certainly uh, around quite a bit, made many friends among uh, crew members. So she was a, a very likable woman, and a big, a bigger than large, bigger than life woman, larger than life. And she certainly was larger at that point in her life. She was still sexy in her 40s or 50s, a very sexy woman. She was around, and you know, I mean, we tried to stage it with her knowledge of everything that was going on. But she went beyond these allegations. I just toned it down. I mean, she's really an innocent eyewitness. She tells us basically that, you know, she knew the boys from the club. Oswald knew Ruby. Ruby knew Oswald. Ferry was there, too, which is not too hard to believe. Brian Doyle Murray has a way about him. He's a brother of Bill Murray. Got that Irish quality that sort of Jack Ruby, who was Jewish, had, too. It was a vigor, a charisma. I love the way uh, Brian Doyle speaks, too, in that flattened American accent. You want to hear further testimony from me? Can you do that? This is actual testimony uh, from the Warren Commission of their dialogue. And that's, of course, Jim Garrison playing Earl Warren, which was offended some people. See, if I'm eliminated, there won't be any way of knowing any bit of the truth pertaining to my situation. He's like saying, I could tell you something very important and you're not listening, and you don't care, and you'll let me die, which is the truth. <laughs> Getting the uh, seventh floor to shoot was very tough. It took a lot of negotiation with the county commission of, uh, of Dallas. They voted by one vote to let us do it. Uh, we used the seventh floor. The sixth floor was an exhibit, but we tried to, uh, we cleaned up the seventh floor and made it as close to the warehouse of the time as we could, and also uh, tried to keep the perspectives. Uh, we, we were allowed to shoot something from the sixth floor for perspective purposes from the, uh, from the window, but nothing else. So we used so often the perspectives of the sixth floor to show the, 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 uh, the car and the route. And you can see very clearly there was a tree at that point, uh, very famously uh, cut down by Hoover's FBI right after the uh, murder. That blocked uh, a part of the view of the president in the car. In any case, uh, you can see uh, through the scene in the movie, too, that the shot is coming, is as the president is coming towards you. In the first place, the car is violating all Secret Service rules of that time. The car must be moving at, I believe, 15 to 25 miles an hour. It depends on where. If there's an overhang, it has to move faster, like windows and stuff like that. No windows would be allowed to be open on the route. So they made the car hook right on uh, Houston Street, which is a huge mistake. I mean, that means the, sl the car slows down, travels underneath a set of uh, open windows, approaching uh, the book depository. So Oswald, or whoever it is, is a straight shot at the president of at least 11 seconds. I mean, there's no way. He's a straight head-on shot. He can't miss if you have a decent rifle, of course, which Oswald didn't have. Nor was perhaps Oswald in the window, I doubt it. But the point is that... Uh, it was a perfect, uh, what we call in Vietnam, the L-shaped ambush. It was a perfect ambush. At the uh, head of the L would be the sixth floor depository. On the right, there might have been a man uh, on, the, uh, on the Houston side, Houston Street side. And then the fence would be the closeout of the hook on the L. The guy at the fence is a takeout guy. He takes out the president if he's alive or wounded or whatever. I mean, they couldn't miss. He was a dead duck. He, he pull, they pulled them off a straight route down uh, Dealey Plaza. He would have been going 25, 30 miles an hour. He would not have been hittable, even in an open car from that distance. And you can see that perspective in the movie. But when you hook him off into the side street and then push him down Elm Street, when he makes that curve at three miles an hour, whatever it was, and Oswald doesn't even shoot at that point, it's like something's going wrong here. So whatever went wrong was quickly fixed, but definitely he took the shot at the fence to kill the president, because he would have perhaps have survived. But the shot at the fence was clean, and it was a can't miss, right, you know, blowing him up, blowing Kennedy backwards and to the left. The man like your Carcano, whatever, the Italian World War II rifle was called, uh, jokingly in World War II, the humanitarian rifle, because it was so bad. And none of the FBI experts actually could fire that same weapon. They used other weapons, and they couldn't match the shooting. No FBI. It's great shooting. And Oswald was known only as a fair shot. He was a fair shot. He wasn't a bad shot or a good shot. Our movie unit probably did this reconstruction of the crime more than any single human entity. Uh, the FBI could not have matched our, our intensity of detail. 
And the amount of time we took, three weeks in Dealey Plaza with permission of the city to blow the president to pieces each time, special effects and all, same crowds, we did it to death. We did it over and over and over again for cameras, and over many days. It was exhausting, perhaps the most exhausting two to three weeks of my life. I, I mean, it was amazing the amount of work had to be done in the heart of Dallas at high noon <laughs> and killing the president. It was depressing, you know, to do that. But actually, nobody has ever heard that assassination and seen it and felt it as we did with all those extras, with the sound, the excitement, the echoes of the shots, the pigeons flying off the roof. It's a very rare thing. It was a privilege to see it from so many different angles. I love this actor, J.J. Johnston. He works, he works out of Chicago. Just typical, uh, but interesting street mobster. Everybody, a lot of people knew that Shaw was Bertrand. That was just typical. You know, it wasn't a big thing to hide your identity for uh, sexual purposes. But I do like the timing of this uh, skeleton. <laughs> this is a uh, New Orleans funeral. It's a wake with spirit. And I love the way J.J. Johnson spins the tables at the end on Bill Broussard, on uh, Michael Rooker, and says, what you, and you owe me. So you get a sense right there and then that Rooker's a little corrupt, too, which is going to pay off later. This is hilarious because there's so many Oswalds that keep popping up. I mean, there were, there were stories I didn't believe, but these stories I did believe. There were solid, it was solid witnesses, people with no ax to grind. But a guy who'd go up to a car salesman and could do this wants to be remembered for later. And you can see how Oswald's face can easily blend. I used Frank Whaley from uh, Born on the Fourth of July and The Doors to play him just as a favor. You know, he did a favor to me as a cameo, but in Frank's sort of indistinct face, you see a little bit of Gary's indistinct face. There was sort of that quality of able to disappear that they had, be anonymous. This is the funniest story, and this is actually the way I was told the story, and it's written up. Now, this whole business is hilarious with Sylvia Odio because Odio is really a rock-solid witness, too, and, and did a lot of good. Uh, she was a, you know, a working uh, Cuban mother, a young woman, very intelligent, and uh, she was being approached by the underground in a very obvious and crude way, as if, again, to set up the identity of Lee Harvey Oswald. And he stood away in the shadows, and she doesn't... I don't know if she could... She always felt it was him. But the, Mex the CIA... Uh, and the Warren Commission has uh, Oswald in Mexico at this time. This is one of the weirdest, another black hole of scenery. I mean, you go to Mexico, you never leave. Uh, that was not Oswald in the embassy. Uh, although Oswald may have gone to Mexico, uh, he was not him in the embassy that day. Uh, that's, the picture is ridiculous, as you can see. And even Thomas Attlee Phillips, who had the most, perhaps, to do with that side of the operation. He's one of the, he's the big, the big kahuna in Mexico City. and. He, his name crops up again and again in this course of assassination. Phillips himself said that uh, Oswald had never been to, was not in Mexico. So they were trying to, it's again, it's sheep dipping of some kind. It's another Oswald, call him Joe Blow again, and he's down there, and they're just perhaps setting up the possibility of another patsy. The photos in the backyard is an endless quagmire. I happen to believe that that is a mat job. And you, people will argue for that forever. But again, it's just the point. I'm saying it's one of another hundred coincidences that keep coming up in this crazy case. So, you know, you win one, you lose one. What's the point? I mean, you've, you, there's so much evidence here of, uh, that Oswald is something else that you just, there's no point arguing. I mean, it's just move on. Uh, I'm going to throw out an idea. That, you know, you're an, if you're an intelligence person, you're, you read uh, John le Carré or George Smiley, you believe some of that stuff, that, that people are intelligent in this world. If, you assa if you're going to invade Cuba, you would try to assassinate Castro. That's, that's, you don't even have to think, okay? Now you're a political leader. You want to pull off something. A, a terrorist cell would operate as a cell. You only know who you're working for. You could have several people working for you from different places. They don't know. They, they're all working together. But if you're intelligent enough, like a, you know, a guy who's done this before, who's run operations in foreign countries, which we used to do, guys like Lansdale, guys from uh, the CIA, like... Bill Harvey, like Kim Roosevelt, uh, all these guys were, were adventurers in a way. And uh, uh, what you do is basically, you know, you're running a chessboard where you're running a lot of uh, disinformation around. And what, part of that disinformation is you've got some Oswalds, you've got Patsies. I mean, there, uh, there's much, many stories that abound of a near hit in Miami on Kennedy that occurred prior to Dallas.
he was hunted. He was hunted those last few uh, weeks. Uh, definitely assassination attempts were heard of, or, or threats, more threats were made. It was a very uh, dangerous time, certainly not a time to leave windows open and take uh, the security precautions that they did that day. If, uh, for example, the hit had taken place in Miami, it is quite possible what I'm trying to say is that there was an Oswald who could have had a Miami identity in the same way that Oswald had a New Orleans and a Dallas identity, you see. He, they have people who are patsies ready to go or close to going. Somebody got Harvey Oswald the job in the bookstore. Somebody decided the bookstore would be a hit ground, and somebody who's smart, who's military, who's precise, rigged it so that the car would have to come that way, and it would slow down. And there would be a patsy in that window because it was the easiest window to access and to see. That's what I, I as a military person, uh, it's just my natural instinct. By the way, just for the record, in 75, there, some researchers, researchers believe they discovered that the man who received the tourist card immediately before Oswald at the Mexican embassy, the supposed Oswald, was a CIA employee named William, William Gaudet, Gaudet, G-A-U-D-E-T. Oswald was found, uh, Minox camera was a very uh, uh, spy camera of the time, very advanced piece of equipment, and uh, Oswald had one. And they had, uh, the prints developed from the roll of film found among Oswald's possessions uh, were of civilian scenes of Europe, but five of them show military scenes either in the Far East or Central America. Dallas policeman Gus Rose told the CBS how New Orleans FBI agent Warren DeBreeze pressured him to remove the camera from the Dallas police inventory sheet. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is that real life is really what's happening when you don't believe it. <laughs> it's like real life is beyond the pale for most people. Uh, our realities alone would shock the other person if we really knew each other the way we know each ourselves. So I'm saying that there's really uh, amazing stories in this case. I threw out dozens of more colorful ones, probably, because I felt these were true. Clay Shaw was a, a, a big, uh, big shot on the local scene. He was the head of the International Trade Mart. He was a, a restorist of antiques. He was a bon vivant in, in the, in the uh, French Quarter. He was a well-known figure. Uh, International Trade Mart's a huge organization. Perry Russo, who I got to know pretty well, was a cab driver with one, uh, several fingers missing. Tough guy, very tough, macho, gay, tough guy. And we used to sit up around and talk, you know, long hours, have dinner. Perry was an outspoken right-wing uh, fanatic. He really hated, he liked Hitler and he hated the Jews, blah, blah, blah. But there was a fucking honesty to this man that I cannot tell you. It was just like, he always told you what he saw and witnessed, you know? So he knew what his opinions were and he knew that you didn't agree with him. But he, when, whenever he talked about himself, he was a cab driver. He was proud of it. He was an honest, honest man. He said, I don't want to be anything but a cab driver because it's the only thing I can do to keep me honest. And he said, as, as, you know, they, they, they rigged it so they made him look like he was hypnotized and recanted his testimony, all the usual ugly tricks. But the, tr the truth of the matter is that Perry Russo said the same thing then, and he still says the same thing now, which is that, you know, he was part of a, a rough group, and they partied a lot, and he knew a lot of people in that underworld, and for sure, Clay Bertrand was one of them, and he knew, and everybody knew who he was, by the way, in that world. They knew that he was Clay Shaw, because Shaw was the head of the trademark in uh, New Orleans, and it was a big port, as you remember. We used to ship stuff there. I was in the Merchant Marine myself for a while. Shaw apparently prided himself on being uh, a class, class oriented, as do many people in New Orleans, which is very Bourbon-esque, very Roman, uh, still very uh, French in a sense of the Bourbon, uh, 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 love of the king, love of monarchy, monarchists, uh, very fertile, you know, in terms of, I'm not saying all they all are, but many of them would be natural-born fascists. They would always want a retrogression back to the strongman leader concept of the patriarch. I think Tommy Lee was uh, having a lot of fun with this role, I think. He enjoyed it, he wanted it. He would, he would go out and he'd find the right length of the wig, the colors he wanted to paint on his body. He really studied detail. <laughs> Kevin Bacon is Mary Antoinette. That was very funny. That was uh, Tommy's idea of painting himself gold. Uh, and poppers were very popular back then. May still be. I looked at Clay Shaw, I see a handsome man, but underneath that I see brutality. Brutality in every way. 
uh, a very, very uh, twisted man, a very scary man for me. And that's why I went so far as to even dramatize the uh, sadomasochistic uh, sex scenes with, with, with Kevin Bacon and Joe Pesci. I just wanted to get into the concept of uh, the games these guys played. They played tough. Uh, people must not confuse uh, homosexuality with weakness, uh, you know, or, or tenderness necessarily. But that's not the point. I mean, if, if Clay Shaw had been into hookers, it would have been hookers, that's all. It, was, it had to be traumatized because it was very important to make the point that Clay Shaw was Clay Bertrand. Because everybody knew Bertrand, and, every, and by knowing Bertrand, you know that he knew Ferry, Oswald, Perry Russo, the cab driver. I mean, there was a bund, an underground bund. I mean, it was moving around, new people were coming in and out. But dirt, certainly they knew each other. That shot, I believe, at the famous uh, restaurant in New Orleans, it's Antoine's, it's called. It's got a beautiful interior. That's my son at the age of uh, six. In the movie, we uh, attributed to uh, Garrison the information about Shaw's background in Permandex, but in real life, uh, in, in the real story, Jim did not have access to that information at that time, nor did he have access to a picture identifying Shaw with uh, Ferry. His history is long, and Clay Shaw has a long history of involvement with intelligence agencies from both sides, and involvement even in fascist groups like the one in Italy, from which he was expelled, uh, Permandex. He was a member of the board of Permandex and also another company called Centro Commercial Mondial or something, uh, which also was thrown out of Italy for espionage reasons. And uh, assassination had, had been one of the topics. Uh, they were tough right-wing fascists, uh, supporters of the dead Mussolini, and they wanted to, to uh, kick butt in, in Italy, which was too leftist for them. And he was kicked out of that country. But Garrison did not know that at the trial. He found out about that, unfortunately, later. A lot of stuff has come to the light about Clay Shaw, and I don't have room here to go into it, but believe me, it's a fascinating mystery uh, story. It's like the mask of Demetrius. Uh, the man is a genius. And I certainly would have loved to have heard him more, you know, speak more often truthfully. It would have been more fun. But he lied his way through the garrison trial completely. Never told one word. He even said he didn't know David Ferry. And that was a joke because they have pictures of them and about 100 people saw them together. And here he is saying, I don't know David Ferry. I mean, the guy, Clay Shaw was a stone mask. He was a great actor with a great pompous manner. And he used to hang out in New York and go to plays. And, you know, Tennessee Williams would probably be one of his buddies or one of these people he knew. You know, he knew people. He was sophisticated. He wrote plays himself. Very interesting character. Uh, you know, you can smile and smile and still be a villain. So that's one of my favorite scenes. It's obviously a dramatic license, and but they did have a meeting on Easter Day, I believe it was. That line about, you know, a patriot is also a person who needs, may have to defend his country against its government is a true, true, and it's not a right-wing militia statement, although people would like to libel it as such. But it's a true state of affairs, which unfortunately is more Orwellian than it is uh, right-wing. Orwellian in the sense of being caught in a fascist tyranny, where without knowing it, it's a benign fascism. As Costner says, benign in the sense that you don't even know what's happening. You're comfortable. Comfort is given to you, economic, materialist comfort. But your true free choice as an individual uh, to exercise your freedom is denied you without your knowing it. No one can dissent in a true manner. Uh, uh, certainly Garrison couldn't. He exercised free choice and he fought and he lost. He became a footnote in our media history, at least up to now. I am hopeful that with movies like mine and William Davies' fine new book, uh, Let Justice Be Done, based on some real research, and The uh, Destiny Betrayed by De Eugene De Junio, people in the 21st century will come, perhaps, to understand the great tragedy that happened in American history in 1963, instead of dismissing it as a mi minor uh, chapter in a brief presidency where John Kennedy was succeeded by apparently a similar president, Lyndon Johnson, who carried out his policies. This is absolute distortion. That was the way it first broke uh, against Garrison. There was a leak already, and the press uh, went hammered him, and they went after him from day one, and with a you know attacking him for defrauding the, the, the treasury of a few dollars <laughs> instead of concentrating on the larger issue. 
understand what we're trying to do. Of course, uh, Jim's accusations they thought was bad for the tourist industry of New Orleans. Money comes first. And it does. This is the end of the uh, innocent days. This is where you have to operate in the open with everybody watching. And I think he does a noble thing, and he offers those who want to get out, out. Did he do it? In real life, I don't know how he did it, but he certainly gave me the impression of being a man you could talk to and reason with, and he would let you out if he didn't want to. He had too many volunteers. He trusted too much. Those are his predecessors on the wall. I'm going home to where I can get a decent day's work done. Mr. Garrison I think that's the best reaction you can do. Keep a low blood pressure on that one. But accidentally, out of this brouhaha emerges the pressure. Now that things are public, there's pressure brought on people like, guess who, David Ferry, <laughs> who's pretty buzzed out because he's uh, been compromised by this. I can't, I can't go home. <laughs> I love this scene because I really got Joe wound up that night <laughs> just to try to get him angry enough. It's freezing cold in New Orleans, <laughs> but he's great. He has, like, I loved working with him. Uh, he was a very funny man and very wise. But he's brilliant in this. He, he's the only one I knew who could have really pulled Ferry off for me. I don't know. Something about him. It's one of my favorite scenes. We shot it in the ugly little motel, the Fontainebleau. I think one of the real locations. We tried to keep it ugly. Nothing there. Let's just go with a beat. This wig, according to people, would often move around. <laughs> and he was, he was a mess, poor David. He was a real mess. He wanted to be a priest, oh. and he even got kicked out of that. <laughs> but actually, David Ferry has more to do probably with America history than we know. Because not only do I think he was peripherally involved in this thing, but I really believe he was, uh, in those cancer research uh, things that he was doing, he was working very closely with the Intelligence Committee as sort of a, a zookeeper uh, for them because they were doing secret experiments at the uh, National Public Health Institute with uh, particle accelerators. They were trying to break down viruses and do all kinds of new viruses genetically on monkeys. And that's where I think they, uh, they were working, you know, the word cancer comes up, but also the word uh, AIDS comes up. And the blood transfusions and the polio vaccine of 1950s comes up also. It's a, another story, another movie sometime. But, this, by the way, uh, what he's saying here, well, there's no record of him saying that, but it's clear from the information that we provided that Shaw was agency, Ferry was agency, or a contract agent of the agency who worked with him during the Cuban crisis. Bannister was uh, FBI. So the accusation is not wrong. And Ruby, we, we don't jump to. Ruby's as if he's beneath these people. It's like the angle out the door just to show the uh, sense of menace, somebody possibly listening. Same time, keep the rhythm going. It's a scene I shot really uh, with this energy, this desire to get it down in one or two takes, because I knew it would exhaust uh, an actor like Joe. I mean, it's a hard role. You, you, you get worked up for this, and you you can't do it seven times sometimes. you got to do it once or twice. And, so you got to fly. So you follow him. Oh, look at the wig. <laughs> he looks like the roto rooter man here. <laughs> They say I have no sense of humor. Fuck. Is this cruel or what? David Ferry would be a legend like Davy Crockett in this country, and people would be making movies about called Davy Ferry. <laughs> There'll be stories on Ferry that will proliferate through the ages. David Ferry emerges as the 20th century icon. This is a real hindrance because now it starts to get crazy. You volunteers show up, lunatics, wait, people waste your time. False leads, tons of false leads. This became a circus. And then he did not have a staff of anything close to the Warren Commission. It's a small group, and he has to run a regular office at uh, public expense, as you can see. And the, the newspapers are against him. Nicely staged scene, I thought, because we put a lot of, uh, I put some friends in who are visiting from all Europe, and that gave it a nice international quality. I love the law books, the peace, the calm. This is their security state. Live on is right. Uh, Garrison blew it here. He should have gotten Ferry out of the limelight and uh, kept him. But he couldn't and he didn't and uh, whatever. He didn't have the money for it, but it was a serious mistake on, uh, on Garrison's part. 
Listen, I gave this man my word. This is our case. Oh, Ivan is right. Jay Sanders is right in this scene, and unfortunately, Garrison is not paying attention to him. And now he's saying your office is bugged on top of it. It happened. I like the way Sanders was standing there, the whole scene, just waiting. And uh, it turned serious so sudden. And that was a key loss, the uh, fairy death. And his apartment was a strange tale. To leave this life is for me a sweet prospect. He left two suicide notes, which is bizarre. Shot this whole scene in one 360-degree take, which I cut up, but I think you can see the flow here. It's a very tough scene, but that's what the apartment suggested to me, and it would be a nice move, and Bob lit it this way. We shot it in one take, uh, but it took a bit of rehearsing. A lot of little details. There had been evidence of the autopsy of his mouth being forced open. So in the end, David Ferry was a good Catholic boy. He, perhaps that was his form of redemption. He was the most uh, remorseful. It's ironic, too, that his paymaster, uh, to take the weapons to Cuba, in which he was involved at times, was Eladia Del Valle, who was killed the same day in Miami. His head split open on the machete. I put Clayton Townsend, my producer, in as that role, and you'll see a glimpse of him later in the movie, and dead in the car. Now you see the way they walk back through there again. It's a real swing without the body. This is a second time around, by the way. Man's afraid to die, and then he, but he kills himself in a way that leaves no trace. But he leaves two unsigned suicide notes. I think Jim's asking excellent questions that have never been answered. I just love the persuasiveness of that man. He's a real strong salesman. He beats down Michael Rooker, and he also allows Rooker uh, to show the weakness in character of, of this composite he's playing, the man who betrays his boss to the other side because the other side has the odds. Uh, the, the Cuban uh, excuse theme was common in those days. And, okay, it wasn't a single man theory, but, you know, it was Castro who killed him uh, because he'd been trying to kill Castro. That was the inside story. So if you hit somebody with that information, you made them feel like they were on the inside. And, but we don't want to stir up the American public because they're going to go nuts and want to attack Cuba. There's going to be a war with Russia, right? So you talk people out. That's pretty clever. That's what they call disinformation, you see. So they, it's not like they're saying, you back down. They're saying, you know, we know. We know the story. It's not so simple. But this is the reason we're doing it, for national security. Play along with us, give up your boss. And now he gives up his boss. Meanwhile, his boss is in Washington. This is also fictionalized, but uh, Garrison was approached by R Richard Case Nagel. The most interesting story, you should read it in the book. It's complicated. But Nagel's story is bizarre, and he was a CIA. He claims to have been a CIA person, and he really was scared and told Garrison a bunch of stuff but nothing of this importance that you're going to see in this scene. Donald Sutherland really uh, is a composite to me of, of the knowledge that's available to Garrison. It's not just knowledge that Garrison ever heard. Garrison believed in this theory, uh, Cold War theory, for motivation, the same as uh, Fletcher Prouty did, who played, whose character Mr. X is based on. But uh, he came to his conclusion, and you should read his book to understand how Jim Garrison came to that conclusion, because it's a very well-drawn one. But it is not taking the same course as that of what the film is taking. I'm also educating the audience, in a sense, to a higher level of concept, of motive. I've given them story, crime, tension, and the, and the concept of unraveling witnesses as, a, as in the conventional mystery story, right? I get the Christie uh, style. So you interview the suspects, and they all lead one to the other, and bam, bam, bam. Now, all of a sudden, he's called to Washington by a deus ex machina, which is the outside force. And he's jolted up a whole uh, spectrum here. He's now dealing into, he's through the looking glass on this scene for sure. And uh, Donald Sutherland is our guide to hell. Uh, it's, it's also a key moment, one of the most noted in the film. It was, should have been the intermission after this, because so much is going to be told to you that it's going to be like, it takes time to just grasp the whole meaning of it and how it ties back. This is an approximation of my own feelings the day that I first met Colonel Prouty, Fletcher Prouty, who was a man, tall, erect, military bearing, six, late 60s, before he got sicker. He's, he's sick, but he's still alive, and he's, he's a wonderful man, but filled with honor and strength and dignity and kindness and truth and graciousness. Of, and he sat with me, a stranger to him, and talk to me honestly, man to man. I was sent by General Y to the South Pole. Well, actually, this is a composite, because his real commanding officer probably sent him to the South Pole, as I remember. Krulak 
but it represents his paranoia, too, about Ed Lansdale, who was not in the military and was not his commanding officer, but was CIA and worked with uh, Fletcher off and on for many years. Chris Tippett's murder. That's 2 o'clock in the afternoon of the next day, New Zealand time. But already, their papers had the entire history of this unknown 24-year-old man, Oswald. Studio picture, detailed biographical data, Russian information, and were pretty sure of the fact that he killed the president alone, although it took them four more hours before they even... This is a key moment, in my opinion, and shows you the works of professionals, and it's such a sloppy time thing, because New Zealand is so off the map that it's quite conceivable this happened, and I really believe Fletcher when he says it. Well, it was four hours, three hours, it's irrelevant. Even if it was one hour, zero hours, it was a profile that was prepared quickly. It had been pre-prepared, as was his legend in Russia, in Mexico City, in Dallas, and in New Orleans, where he was crudely set up in New Orleans to be on a debate on a television show owned by the Steins, who hated Jim Garrison and who wanted somehow to establish Lee Harvey Oswald as a communist. Colonel Reich. This is a key moment, too. Colonel Reich, Maximilian Reich, taking the order to stand down in, in San Antonio and Fort Sam Houston, the 112th intelligence. Studied the route, checked all the buildings. Never would have allowed all those wide open, empty windows overlooking Dealey. Never. We'd have had our own snipers covering the area the minute a window went up. These are military considerations that are crucial. Umbrellas were being uh, worked on at that time in the James Bond period as spy devices with flechettes in them, gas poisons, bullets. That really bothered uh, Fletcher. It really is important to realize that it was a violation in every way of every code. There was nothing that was being paid attention to. Not one valid uh, attempt to, to secure the president's life, especially with a very sloppy thing that had happened in Miami where he was almost uh, hit on before, you know, he'd been traveling through these areas, and he was a target for a while. I think there was no question he was a target, at least through November, maybe into October. The military intelligence is the most disgusting, having destroyed their files. James Powell of Army Intelligence was in Dealey Plaza that day. He was identified, and it's a mysterious story that you have to follow onto yourself. It's his character in the movie. Chris Renna, my doctor, who plays James Powell with his skull-like face. Teddy Kennedy was described as running from door to door about an hour after the assassination in search of a working telephone. It was more of a case, uh, really, of sporadic brownouts than total blackout. Lines would go dead, return to normal when a sufficient number of people had hung up and go dead again. So some kind of limitation may have been placed on the phone system. Who knows? But in any case, that was a slight error there, and it was certainly hit on by the media to no end. But everything else was left alone. I think Sullen uh, has the ability in his, uh, as a very experienced actor, dramatist, to uh, speak very quickly when he saw those 11, 12 pages of dialogue. He knew what he was, far more than I did, what he was up against. And I think he knew the pace of the scene and helped me enormously in uh, setting it right here. And he knows this by heart, too. I mean, Donald is an actor who comes in wholly prepared. He knows the, uh, the dialogue completely, and it's a question of how he delivers it and his thinking process at the time. He doesn't worry about to text. But he was nervous that morning before he shot it. That I can tell you, because that was a hell of a lot to learn in one day. And Oliver shot it, of course, with one camera at one point and just kept going and going and going. So Donald knew, you know, in advance, he said, it's Donald, I, I don't need to shoot this whole 12 pages. Don't worry. I'll shoot two pages, whatever. He said, yeah, OK, don't worry. And then he learned all 12 because he figured that, he'd <laughs> that I'd go for it all in one take if I could. <laughs> it sort of becomes a challenge between the actor and the director. They one-up each other kind of thing. I don't know what my uh, critics would expect. You know, they would expect me to stay on the words and give you the whole document. Ultimately, there's the facts. But the facts, this is not that kind of a... Entertain. This is a movie, and it is a drama, and it just uses paper metaphorically, and it shows they're, they're, it's in those words. You have to believe, otherwise you go out and you read, which is what the result of a movie is. But there is no satisfying the literal mind. They would go, they'll break your chops on everything. You'll have to see every line of paper, every documentation. So here's Kennedy firing uh, Alan Dulles, Charles Cavell, and Richard Bissell, the number three guy at the CIA. You have shockwaves running down the CIA. You have shockwaves in the Department of Defense. You have shockwaves in the White House. You have no idea. Everyone's talking. You, if you've ever been to D.C., and you know the gossip factor. This is amazing stuff. Kennedy is moving things around, and there's a book out called Seven Days in May, made into a popular film, postulating a military takeover of the United States. Uh, and it was a very believable uh, Cold War scenario with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas and Frederick March. We all loved it. 
And Kennedy loved it, and he loved spy books, and he would he'd say things like, yeah, there's a possibility if I ever had another Bay of Pigs and screw up, they'd, they would do that, something like that, to a young president. In other words, it was in the air. Fear, treachery, betrayal, spying, the U-2 incident. It's all Oswald with his spy, James Bond uh, BS, you know. Oswald loved all that stuff. And he studied fake photography, he studied dying, he studied all these techniques. By the way, by firing those people uh, from the Bay of Pigs, it did unfortunately raise into our consciousness Richard Helms, who climbed the rope of the greasy ladder of the CIA and became, I believe, the, uh, the uh, I think he took Bissell's position at the head of the, uh, Cu the secret Cuban war. So Helms is organizing all the assassination attempts, you see, and invasion attempts on Cuba from 62 on. This is key. So unfortunately, Helms comes to the forefront on the Cuban situation. The assassination attempts against Castro continue right up to the day of Kennedy's death and afterward. No war, no money. By the way, uh, during Nixon's administration, there were several attempts uh, by Nixon to kill Castro. The swine flu was introduced to Cuba. Silly things, but dangerous things. People get killed. And Kennedy wanted to end the Cold War in his second term. It was a very strange time. You know, Jack Kennedy must have had some real hard lessons as a young man in an older man's world. Firing these guys was amazing. He appointed an outsider, unfortunately, as the head of the CIA, and that didn't do much good, John McCone, who Fletcher Prouty told me was promptly whisked off around the world uh, by the CIA to visit all the station chiefs and figure out the CIA, but basically to keep him out of the loop so that he wouldn't be in on the assassination, which is an interesting theory. McCone was really left, kept out of Washington, D.C. So Helms is really a major player here and a dirty player in my opinion, although he will deny it to the day he dies. I uh, ran this scene by John Newman, uh, one of our consultants who'd written JFK in Vietnam, and he uh, amended it somewhat with the language, uh, using some of the military language that you heard there. So, uh, you know, one can never go behind closed doors in history, but you try with people who read the documents as much as possible, although people don't talk like they're right either. But this is a uh, stretch, but there's no question that Johnson had his own backtrack, second track to uh, the Vietnamese, war via the military, and he had his own set of information, which was uh, actually more pessimistic, probably, than Kennedy's. Johnson knew better than Kennedy that it was a morass, which is, makes it all the more wo wonder that when he became president, he so quickly acted to increase our role. My belief, my opinion, is that he felt that Kennedy was too weak, and that by being stronger than Kennedy, he could make the difference in Vietnam. But Kennedy was far too intelligent, in my opinion, and many will agree with me to go into that quagmire in, with combat troops. He told that to my, Senators Wayne Morris and Mike Mansfield, two of the most honest senators ever existed, who, who have repeated that quote repeatedly, so to Roger Hillsman, who was a great Assistant Secretary of State, to Schlesinger, to Sorensen, who put it in his book in 1965. He wrote it as an NSAM 263, very clearly on October 11, 63. What more can you expect? How can this debate go on and on and on? It's just very clear that Kennedy had to win the election of 64. He was facing a right wing. And he would have won it. And there would have been vaster changes in this country in 64, 68 than it had ever been seen. And uh, instead of the war, the deadening, gloomy war that Johnson brought us. And Nixon continued and continued, like some weird-ass Macbeth into the dark nightmare of American soul, wherein we just suicide ourselves over and over and over. Pros, always pros. He wouldn't use a bunch of amateurs to kill a, a president in an, in an ambush, military ambush. Use the best, the best you got. And these guys don't even, you know, they're cells. They don't know what they're doing. They're doing their job. They're following orders. They may be protecting the president. They don't know what they're there for. Only perhaps at the end is, is the switch pulled. Maybe only the last shooter knows it's the president. There's a lot of strange uh, ways to do a military operation. But believe me, it can be sealed at really tight, very tight, into cells four or five people, three, four people in one cell, three, four, five cells. You can really do it tight. 273 was not as aggressive as the uh, follow-up statement of January 64, which is only two months later, but it definitely set a new tone. And the January 64 follow-up was highly aggressive, uh, calling for American uh, covert warfare against uh, North Vietnam. By putting covert operatives back into Vietnam, we really uh, created the environment in which the Tonkin Gulf incident occurred which was a bogus incident that we built up into a dramatic attack by the Vietnamese on one of our boats, and we therefore, Congress allowed us to declare war, although it was never declared. It was allowed, so to speak, uh, in Vietnam. Johnson fully well knew that it was a cover-up, and, and a, uh, in fact, you can relate it maybe to his knowledge of how things were manipulated through the Kennedy assassination to the way he manipulated the Tonkin Gulf because he knew the military truth, and he still uh, allowed that to happen so that he could blame the North Vietnamese for starting the war.
It was sort of like a, a botched Korean War operation. Now this is where Garrison is in for it. He's got to make trouble, otherwise he'll never get out of this thing. That's the uh, where Jim missed the boat. He should have arrested Ferry and Bannister right away and made the investigation out of New Orleans instead of giving it to the FBI. I think uh, Sullen did a great job for us and uh, made this thing fly. And very believable as a bureaucrat who knows a uh, patriot. Many of them in government are patriots who love this country, but they're in systems, systems that are not always uh, working the way they should be. Jim had never been a particularly uh, Kennedy lover. He was a little more conservative than Kennedy, more military-oriented, but uh, he came to love him in this uh, period of reflection and came to understand, which he hadn't in 63 when he was killed, he came to understand what some of the things that Kennedy was doing and the, how the patterns added up. When Jim busted Shaw, a very important thing happened. Shaw was under shock, I think, when he was mugged and booked at the, at the jail and gave his alias away right then and there to Officer Habighorst. That testimony was later dismissed by the Judge Haggerty and was one of the crux moments in the case. This is one of Jim Garrison's uh, last performances. Unfortunately, he was very old and barely making it. Uh, he was sick, but we shot in an upward angle and gave him the shot as the Chief Justice Warren, who he resembled to some degree. I thought it was a very uh, ironic and pointed uh, reversal of history. Although I have no personal criticism of Judge Warren, because I do think he was a good man in many ways. But he would only go so far, and I think he knew that, when he was appointed to the Warren Commission by Johnson. I think the, the theory was always the same, you know, let's not spook the people, let's not panic the people, this thing could get ugly. It probably was Castro who killed him, and if it was Castro, the people are going to, it's going to be a war situation with Russia, and we're going to re repeat the 62 crisis. That kind of a thinking is enough to keep the media basically in the American interest. The media cooperates with the government. That was what they used to do. This white paper was prepared by Walter Sheridan and is one of the black stains on Sheridan's uh, otherwise distinguished career in the Justice Department under Robert Kennedy. But Sheridan was really out of line here. It's the worst single bunch of hearsay uh, the, put together in the, in the vilest order to make Garrison look like a fool. And, and a man who hypnotizes people, which he is allowed to do. A man who pe uses sodium pentothal drugs, which is allowable. Who uses lie detector tests, which are allowable. I mean, they had nothing, nothing on him in this whole thing. Garrison got his revenge by getting a half hour of free time on national television and delivered a brilliant uh, defense actually without any notes. The white paper was aired on June 19, 1967. CIA knew about the program several weeks before it was aired. Similar thing happened to me on Nightline. I went on there with Forrest Sawyer, and he just, in the first minute, showed five-minute clip on Garrison. It was totally distorting of his life. It was disgusting. I sat there stunned. I, I just wondered, what can I do? I mean, they, they gave me a minute to answer, and I just started to get into the surface. Every single thing was on that on that film was was a, was a lie. I think his wife is pretty scared here. Of course, Ramsey Clark, who's now become a real fighter for justice, and I deeply admire him, did tell reporters in '63 that Shaw had been investigated uh, in had been investigated in November, December '63, but he didn't offer any explanation as to why the Justice Department felt it necessary to investigate Shaw in the first place. By the way, uh, Washington Post noted that Clark's remarks affirmed Garrison's suspicion that Sean Bertrand were one and the same. It's the same guy, he was reiterated to George Lardner. It was misunderstood, and I was much criticized for having uh, a meek woman, uh, a typical housewife. You know, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to make her, but this is, I think, an accurate portrayal of the woman I met and what Jim wrote about. You see, the television dominates the, the living room, and it dominates her thinking. She is a television animal. She thinks like everybody else. Uh, she's a conformist, and that is the thing that ultimately will separate Jim from his first wife, Elizabeth. But uh, Jim, when he got into this case, was over, you know, had no support or understanding from his wife, and he had a hard time. Uh, and obviously, people were looking for flaws, and if he dated, uh, you know, a, another woman or was seen in public or drinking or anything like that, just drinking a little too much from the pressure, you know, it, they, would, uh, mo they would make it into a mythology about Jim Garrison being a total flake, you know. They were looking for any flaw in the character. I didn't go into that part of the story, frankly, because it was dramatic, but, you know, I perhaps should have, I don't know, but it was so little big a movie. I had four stories to tell. I had Garrison story. I had the... Oswald's story, I had the Dealey Plaza story, because that's an objective story of, you know, what's going on. The first thing you see in the movie is Dealey Plaza. That's the surface of the onion, the way we heard it and saw it then.
This is a very tough scene to shoot because a lot of dialogue, and we're doing it in one take as much as possible. I like the uh, simplicity of it, the way they one dominates the room, the other one stays in the foreground. She goes, she takes over the room. It's the first cut. Raise our children and live a normal life. I want Hard thing when a man or a woman finds that his partner doesn't believe him. I think this is a replay of one of the fights I had with my wife at that time. <laughs> and I think I was probably going through similar emotions writing this. You won't have any problems fill out your divorce papers on me. Somebody. Somebody's got to have a mission to do this country justice, to do it better, make it better. Are we? This is my Norman Rockwell scene, okay? So leave it alone. No, Everybody's got a right to his Norman Rockwell moment. But if you let yourself be too scared, then you let the bad guys take over the country, don't you? Yeah. 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 Then everybody gets scared. <laughs> trying to make an analogy there for kids. I'm trying to explain it to my own son. Bad guys did take over. They still are in power. But it's not always the case. I don't know. Is that human nature? In school, don't the bad guys take over most of the time? The dishonest ones, the hypocrites. This is the uh, second big discussion of the group, where you can see the expanded office. And I wanted to go over some of the arguments because this is, this is important, especially the argument. You know, they say I made it completely unbalanced. It's untrue. Uh, Bill Broussard makes the points, uh, very valid points, some of the points against Garrison of that time, as you will see. Four eyewitnesses uh, testified to the effect of seeing all three men, Shaw, Cadillac, Ferry, and Oswald, all three. The sheriff came over. No, there was also a trip to a local uh, mental hospital nearby. They're trying to register Oswald here. They were looking for a job in a hospital for him. It's a very weird history on Oswald all the time. He's always trying to be placed, seen. Oswald went to see the FBI two weeks before the assassination. Can I see uh, Special Agent Hostie, please? I'm sorry, he's not in. Can someone else help you? Hostie, Hostie. James Hostie was always around. That was Hostie's own testimony about the note being told, told to my superior officer oh, to destroy it. I think the paper had something That's to do with the Kennedy assassination. Quigley also destroyed the notes in New Orleans, which is a good point. You don't want this on paper. But that he may well have been the original source we have for the telex. I've always wondered about this. I don't know. I, you know, I always say uh, maybe or perhaps. Uh, you can hear the way Costner talks in the conditional tense. But I always wondered about Walter Wagers. I always wondered about this telex and who actually sent it. But it could not. Maybe it was not Oswald. I don't know. No one's ever mentioned that possibly very much. You know, take a shot at the president, not to kill him, but to to create the uh, demand on Cuba, the redemand. That is always a possibility too. It certainly worked that way against De Gaulle in France because there was a lot increasing pressure on these assassination attempts for him to, to uh, fight in Algeria, to return and fight in Algeria, and not to give up. You know for a fact you can't keep a secret in this room between twelve people. This is what I always get accused of, but nobody ever listens to the argument that Jim responds with among the, and also the arguments I did on television. It's amazing the amount of times this gets repeated. It's the stupidest uh, accusation. It's meant to, uh, to create a straw man and destroy that straw man, which is what always happens with the establishment books on the assassination. If you go to the indexes, it's all straw man. We're all listed in out of context, what we're saying. You know, Castro being assassinated by the... I think that's a very lucid argument, and is I've heard it. I, I, and Garrison refutes it, I think, but it's your call. It's thrown out there. Makes perfect. Could the mob wreck the autopsy? I mean, could the mob influence the national media to go to sleep? And since when has the mob used anything but 38s for hits up close? I think these are key questions that never get answered by the mob people. I, how would they do it? Assassins are generally military. This was a coup d'etat with Lyndon Johnson waiting in the wings. Oh, okay, so now you're saying Lyndon Johnson... doesn't mean that Johnson was the killer, as some people have assumed. It just assumes that if there's a vice president who is not unfriendly to you, that he will do his job when the time comes. But that doesn't mean he knows anything about the plan. Don't, maybe there's some rogue element in the government or something. Oh. Conspiracy to cover the rogue element in the government theory is another one that really bugs me because although it could be true, it's just... It doesn't represent the sickness uh, of the uh, where the CIA got to and the military intelligence people in the uh, late early 60s. It just doesn't represent the sickness. But there could very well have been a rogue element. Hard to believe that some more people at a higher level didn't know about it at the highest level of these agencies. Whether it was counterintelligence, the Helms, or Jesus Angleton, I, those two I, are just evil to me, and they come back as evil always, no matter what they do. And um, Lansdale. Maybe. Uh, military intelligence, faceless. FBI, I don't believe so, but I do believe that they played some bureaucratic role in this uh, cover-up aspect. 
Uh, the real life uh, Lou Ivon did not quit Garrison's JFK investigations, but uh, there's no question that several people did quit, including people who were upset with him under different uh, their different names. So in that spirit, I uh, sacrificed a wonderful performance by Jay Sanders from uh, the theater world in New York, uh, who really turned in a fine job. You don't see him very much in movies, which is great, and uh, got a noble, noble countenance. I think he did a great job of backing up Costner, who realizes here he made a mistake. He knows the increasingly desperate situation he's in. He's being told none of his subpoenas are going through. Uh, his witnesses are disappearing or dying. And his family, of course, is falling apart. I mean, he's getting pressure from all sides. As once somebody said of the investigation and the trial, it was like the old man in the sea by Ernest Hemingway in the sense that Garrison was the big fisherman. He caught the big fish. But by the time he got it to the shore, it had been eaten to the bone by the sharks. I don't believe this scene was in the uh, released theatrical version, and it was in the director's cut that was released on video. It was based on the uh, Garrison's appearance on the Johnny Carson show. Carson was very embarrassed. His questions were, were as silly as it looks and uh, trying to make it laughing stock of Jim. But actually, there was so much protest against his uh, questioning of Jim and the way he cut him off that thousands of letters poured in uh, objecting to uh, his treatment of Garrison. And at that point, Carson apparently said to somebody, I never want that guy on my show again. Uh, but it was just typical of that period. And frankly, I got asked these same questions basically by Forrest Sawyer on Nightline and on many other TV shows by people who were equally, how do you say, talking heads. They don't do any homework. They don't do any investigation of their own. They just read what some editor tells them to say. It's a very strange experience to talk to somebody who's a talking head who doesn't know anything about a case because how do you convince them? But I think Jim Garrison handled himself impeccably well in the Carson show. John LaRoquette is doing the uh, Carson role. He did beautifully. I'm sorry I cut him out of the theatrical, but again, it was a question of time. No mug shot, no Jim, fingerprints. Hold that thought. We're going to be back right after these commercials. Who were they? Hold that thought. <laughs> this is a strange incident that happened in the airport where one of his men, it wasn't, as I said earlier, Michael Rooker is playing a composite of people who betrayed Jim, but here he's playing one of the guys who showed up suddenly at the airport. And uh, in the book, uh, Garrison makes it seem like he, you know, it's a strange thing for this guy to show up. And he never understood why until he sort of puts it together with the bathroom incident that follows, but uh, it was never clear to him. Very courageous, Jim Garrison, in this whole period. He never looked for bodyguards. And he, he, he walked openly through the, the minefield, you know. Jim ran it like a military operation, too, at times, you know, and uh, he would be very tough. He was just overwhelmed. He didn't have the resources to really pursue this investigation with the amount of people that he had. And I believe coming up is a scene where you'll see he's set up by the government or set up by somebody very weird because it's a true story of... He writes about in his book uh, about an incident in an airport in a toilet where he was set up. Sometime during this period, also, a similar incident occurred uh, with uh, one of the chief aides of Lyndon Johnson, I think it was Walter Jenkins, was set up in a uh, Washington, public, Washington, D.C. public laboratory, and it ruined his career. Come on, come on, get out here. Jim, where are you going? It was my production designer, Victor Kempster. I made him play the role. He hated it, and he was very good at it as the gay uh, person next door in the next door toilet booth who was trying to get it on with Jim. He, it would be enough to get a picture of those two coming out together and that would libel Jim and that's what they were looking for. And Jim actually just saved his skin by seconds by moving fast because they, uh, it was that very moment of indecision that could have cost him. The other, guy, the other side would have been ready. A return to a home. There's the theme by John Williams, which I love. And it's corny again, allow me my Rockwell. But it's nice to feel that there was some kind of sanity in this crazed world where white is black and black is white. Even that was not to be, as we know in life. Uh, Jim divorced uh, from Liz, married another woman. He was never that good a thinker. Well, he sure fooled us. That's the connection to Bill Broussard, Michael Rooker from the bathroom. Turn it up. If he wins, they'll kill him. This is a very strange comment and actually was predicted by Garrison that he would die, that Robert Kennedy would die. At this point, they think he's a, he's a little bit around the bend, maybe, but uh, the fact is that Kennedy was killed. I have to agree with That's Gary Grubbs as Al Ozer. Great guy. Tennessee actor. Very, very uh, specific vernacular. Laurie Metcalf was wonderful. Was, uh, years later, she became famous on Roseanne, but she was a wonderful, uh, also always been a wonderful Chicago uh, theater actress. Wayne Knight was a great Numa. Jay Sanders, Michael Rooker. It was a great little team. Now, this war has two fronts. In 
constantly attacking me for the fact that uh, Garrison lost the case. They, they ignore the fact that Garrison himself says in advance that the, uh, the, legal, the legal matter is not the ultimate issue. It is the court of public opinion, and that it was his defense of his trial. So that it seems to me that uh, he was pilloried for the wrong reasons completely, and it was deliberately done to destroy him. His only hope was to uh, raise the shitstorm that he had provoked. You gotta raise the stakes. And even so, with, the, with the, uh, the, the odds against him, if he'd had a couple more breaks at the trial, I think he would have been closer. Garrison used to say Darrell lost the Scopes trial, but who remembers that? This was another shock to America's system because it was immediate, like Jack Ruby killing Oswald and Oswald killing Kennedy. This was the fourth murder, King being the third, that we saw really in massive public television awareness. America was at war not only in Vietnam, but was obviously at war here at home. And I think that's what I was trying to say in Platoon in a, way, in a way, is that the Civil War was everywhere. It was in America between ourselves, and it was over there between ourselves. But it's a key moment in Garrison's uh, mythology. It makes sense now that he is a believer in the secret history. But there's no hope, in a way, that they're that strong. Sirhan is another one who was hypnotized. It looked weird story. Too many bullets. Lousy autopsy, badly kept L.A. police work, very badly done. People who saw their shooters who were not investigated, second shooters, people. I mean, it's the same story, except uh, it was a smaller story because he wasn't the president yet. But he just won the California primary, and many people believe, as I do, that he would have been president of the United States because there was a lot of momentum and emotion on Kennedy's side. Humphrey would have been wiped out. That uh, perhaps doesn't uh, sit well with some of the historians, but many people in this country believe that. And sometimes the Robin Hood story is more accurate than the Sherwood Forest story, if you know what I'm trying to say. Because we all create popular heroes. We need them. We need heroes. We need hope in our lives. Garrison could have been that hero. Instead of being the weird footnote that he is, he paid a high price. But his intention was a noble one. As we come to the resolution, John Williams' music booming in. I loved it. I didn't know it was going to be such a long sequence, but it was absorbing to see that this trial, the way it was cut, is quite unique, I think, because it really collapsed time and witnesses as quick as we could. Um, there was so much confusion at this trial. There were so many witnesses that were bizarre, and there was so many foul plays on the part of the, uh, frankly, of the, uh, of the defense. Here's the smoking judge. New Orleans is going to be a pretty wild place. And it was, uh, I believe, an all-male jury. There was a lot of testimony both ways, but I tried to get to the highlights. And now wants I love that look. Vernon Bundy. Vernon Bundy was a heroin addict. But that doesn't mean that he didn't. He, he saw Shaw, he says, with Oswald at this public uh, empty uh, lot in uh, near, near New Orleans. And he was the only one, Vernon Bundy was the only one who really pointed up that the guy had a limp. It was one of those kind of Capra-esque moments, you know. He dropped Oswald off on the voters' line. That's the Clinton, Louisiana scene, and those are some of the eyewitnesses. These are all natural actors. Garrison himself said, I'd rather have a bank president or a successful lawyer or a successful businessman. The question is, is he telling the truth or not? There are many attorneys who are brilliant liars, and there are dope addicts who never learn to lie. I think that Garrison was very mentally ahead of his time and probably saw things in a way that it was totally uh, egalitarian. He was a true civil rights person way before anybody else was. Roy Barnett it was Irvin Diamond, the uh, very powerful uh, defense attorney. Garrison never really recovered from the ridiculous testimony of Spiesel, the accountant from New York, who was, I think, obviously a plant to destroy, completely destroy uh, the, uh, the prosecution. I'm convinced of it. He was a perfect uh, late walk-in witness. Too much, uh, he was right on the money. He said he knew all these people, and he didn't. And it was a sloppy moment on McGarrison's part to call him, but he had a lot of problems. I call him as I see it. Ever use any aliases? Claire Burton. Mr. Shaw, what do you have? This is a key moment, of course, when the uh, alias is uh, ruled as inadmissible. It was a very tough moment for Garrison, who could not argue the whole case. He did argue the opening. He argued the ending. He argued pieces. And it was he who gave his closing statement, much maligned as I was at the time for having said, for having him uh, do it. I, they said that he didn't actually deliver it. That's not true. He did. He did deliver it. It was a beautiful speech, if not exactly the one that I uh, wrote with uh, Zach Clark. I love the way the trial goes. It just moves. It's like a. Actually, I had, I had a little practice shooting trials after the doors because if the, you look at the doors, it's also contracted. It's very hard to tell a trial 
unless you get into a trial movie, because the trials take forever and they're usually highlights of the film. So here we are faced with doing a very important trial at the end of a movie, but it's not what this movie is ultimately going to be about. This is just a summation. This is a summation of possibilities just to remind the audience and to finalize it. An ending, of course, with an appeal. An appeal to think, an appeal to question, to defy. I don't know that it's even possible today to prove that anybody is a CIA agent. It would be impossible because there's plausible deniability. It just would be impossible unless they admitted it. I think it's a big moment. Maybe it's a little sentimental to some, but the fact that his wife did finally show up and support him, although it didn't happen that way, I don't believe was important. That's the uh, Zapruder film as, as it was uh, given to us. It's pretty clear the shot comes from the front, knocks him back to the left. That's Jackie looking for the brains. And I just thought it had to be repeated because it's just not getting through, you know, that people aren't looking at that film. Actually, it was Garrison who freed it from Lifetime. He, he, he subpoenaed Time Life magazine and got this film out and showed it. And it was a shock. Then thereafter, it was released sometime in the 70s. And by the way, that film is untampered with unless somebody tampered with it before we bought it. But that is definitely the Zapruder film. We paid a, a fair share of money for that film. And we broke it down and make it closer. We made it as tight as we could with modern uh, techniques of cinema. Now, those people will tell you that headshot is really a neuromuscular reaction where he's leaning forward first, and that means he's taking the rear shot from, uh, from Oswald, but I don't know why he shoots backwards. It must be his neuromuscular. His neuromuscles must be moving, but it sure looks pretty automatic to me, and I've been in a lot of combat, and I've seen that. People fall backwards generally when they're hit. This is the second million-dollar coincidence. You know, there's two major coincidences in three shots. There's the, the, the shot coming from the rear, knocking him backwards, which makes no sense. And then, of course, the coincidence of this magic bullet, which is about, this is about what they're saying, give or take a few inches here or there. But that is approximately what the claim was. And we now know from the Assassination Review Board that if you think about it, Ford raised the bullet on Kennedy's back of his shoulder to his neck area so that it would theoretically have a little more downward motion by which he could accomplish this magic task. That came out recently, and no one ever said anything about it or questioned Ford as to really seriously what the hell was he doing. He was lying. He was thieving. He was the fox in the chicken coop eating those chickens, man. But they didn't realize that people might get smarter one day than they were. They didn't realize that consciousness was possible among the people, that we had geniuses out there that could maybe create computers and look at these idiots. If they were to take one DNA trace on any of this stuff, they'd solve this thing in a second. They don't want to. You know, American people have to get furious. They have to film us to come out. It has to be a huge hit. Then they do something, and then they forget about it a few years later, like every goddamn government commission that ever existed. They never did any good. They write these reports eight years later, and nobody gives a shit. It's all bullshit, and we pay for it, and pay for it through the nose. They need somebody to get in there and fix that government. I wanted to build this model. It was very important to me that the audience really understand the geographies here as well as possible, and we did this cutting back and forth to real trying to explain sort of more or less where everybody was because it really scientifically adds up. All the closest witnesses, the most important witnesses, see it get the null. There's just so much confusion on the autopsies. I think perhaps Douglas Holm and his newest work, which you can reach through uh, Probe, P-R-O-B-E, Eugene DeGenio on the Internet, or my, you can reach my Internet site and I could put you in touch with it and I could link you to it. But essentially his argument is that there were probably two autopsies the two different, two different bodies prepared, I mean, the same body prepared two different ways. He feels that there were two complete different autopsies. And there's a lot of evidence, I'm not an expert, but Cyril Wecht has always been one of the top watchdogs on coroners, and he's watched this thing, couldn't believe it. This is a key moment here. Key moment when Texas allowed them to take the body. It had tremendous consequences. If the body had stayed in Texas and been investigated by the Attorney General Wagner Carr, it might have, you might have gotten a fair shake. Here, Jim builds to his theory, and I think Kevin paced his speech uh, very nicely. So that he rose, rose, the music rose, the objections rose. At the same time, you have to keep the narrative running. At the same time, you got to have all this imagery. It's a very complicated scene to cut, but it, it's certainly in keeping with the style of the film to date. This shocked a lot of people because we're using a real photograph of Kennedy, which we intercut with a uh, really lifelike model built by Gordon Smith. That's a real shot, by the way. Uh, a lifelike model uh, built by Gordon Smith that, from Canada that really is frighteningly accurate. 
Pierre Fink is amazing. Uh, this is real testimony taken from his uh, from the, his court appearance, which is embarrassing beyond belief. To the second autopsy, that would have been the uh, creation you saw there of, of Kennedy's face by Smith. See, the second autopsy was a mess. It was just run out of Bethesda. There was no first autopsy, but the people who saw him would have been the first autopsy. There were two bodies or something. One somebody rearranged the body on the way into the second autopsy is what Doug Holm is saying. And that's very important, that back wound. with my finger. That won't be necessary, Commander. <laughs> that was actual dialogue. Who's in charge here? I am. Actual testimony. Who's in charge here? He was wondering, and some voice called out from the back, I am. But he never took charge. Like that, to look at the wound of the president who is dead, you don't look around a lot to ask people for their names and who they are. But you and you don't question your military officer? Army General. Oh, yes. Apparently, Fink described a scene of chaos. That's a real shot. It's been argued for years, the throat shot, whether it was an exit wound or an entry wound. That the president's brain has disappeared. Just like the uh, military intelligence records. This is such a crazy story. Jay Sanders comes back. Lou Ivan comes back. The A team gets on the sixth floor of the deposit. And this is obviously speculation. He said, let's just speculate for a moment. And I don't know. I'm making up uh, a concept from what I hear in the intelligence business. But, you know, these are guys who are pros. There's just no question. But that was a window there, you see, that was exactly, uh, we, we went up to all these buildings. And this is the best shot. For, and also a very clean one and anonymous from that place. If I got the third window, I'm not sure. Or the second window, it could have been further to the right. It's Stanley White there from the character on which I based Year of the Dragon. And I'll tell you something else. The guys at the fence, were, if Bowers is right and he saw those guys, that's a very important thing. Those guys are guys. That, you know, Who were they? Were they wearing Dallas police uniforms? Or were they guys in suits? I, you know, Bowers didn't clarify that to me, but. The point is, uh, they were good shots. So uh, uh, Walter Matthau isn't being facetious when he says to Jim Garrison, you get a list of the 100 best shooters in the United States. Find out where they were that day. And if they were in Dallas, check them out, you know? That's the idea. But what Matthau is saying and what Russell Long is saying is it takes good shooting. These are experts. This is military snipership. Now, this is no amateur operation. It's when people say to me, the mob killed Kennedy, I laugh. The mob has no known history of organized military-like hits like this. Ambush is set up, it's beautifully done. The car is slowed down, the route is changed, the windows are open, there's no security because some jackass has slammed the phone down on the 112th uh, group down in San Antonio, the surveillance unit that was supposed to come up and said, don't come. You know, and nobody can trace that call still to this day. Who killed that one? You know, I mean, so many weird stories. But the point is, it was military because it was precisely done, as Fletcher Prouty points out in detail. And so was the cover-up, and so was the confusion. That's all you can do, is you can point up 99, 144 pieces of weird evidence in a film like this, because it is a deconstruction of the Warren Commission, as I call it, a counter-myth, not a, to the myth of the Warren Commission. It was my counter-myth. All I can do is say, here are 140 pieces of deconstruction. And if someone says, well, I can prove you're wrong here, 10, 11, 12, doesn't matter, four, three, two times, fine. But what about the other things you cannot disprove? You know, eyewitnesses, this, that, the weirdness of certain things. I mean, there's so many weird things happen. Mathematically, you pile it into a computer, I think you have a million to one chance of, of, a, of a lone shot, of a lone killer. It's just too much, you see, too much circumstantial and primary evidence. It must have been a mess. I mean, between the Dallas police, the undercover people, uh, potentially people playing roles like the Umbrella Man or whatever. I mean, they're all walking around. And two guys grab Jeannie Hill. They don't even have, uh, you know, they're FBI. They're just undercovers. There must have been a lot of undercovers. The three tramps are very confusing. At first, I too believed that they were too weird to be tramps, and uh, Lou Ivon says so in the movie. But, you know, based on the new discoveries of what the Dallas Police Department, at least it came out because of the film, the identity of the three tramps was finally revealed, and apparently they checked out as tramps. So I'm quite willing to say that was wrong, but it was certainly a weird piece of evidence. This uh, clarifies the uh, possible scenario for uh, Oswald, who I believe, and uh, many researchers believe, was eating lunch at the time of the shooting in the second floor cafeteria, where he went to the Coke machine where Officer Marion Baker spotted him. 
after running those 60 or so seconds. Uh, Oswald uh, was, not, not, was not out of breath. He was very calm, uh, which means it's very hard to believe. He just run down six flights of stairs, shot the President of the United States, which is, a, you can imagine, the amount of pressure. Walks out of the uh, depository, as shown. Those are actual, that's the actual depository with the actual uh, geometrics. So you can see the choice, the back stairs, or does he walk out in front of everybody? And she sees him. They even have a little talk or something but not very long, and he gets out, and he strolls out. He's in no rush to get away. Now, either he's a cool cat and he's just done something, or else he's figured it out. Maybe he's very cool, cooler than we all think. He thinks, okay, the president's just been killed. Something happened. I don't know what. I don't know where the shot came from from the sixth floor, but they seem to think it's this building. I work upstairs. I'm on a lunch break. He still doesn't get it. I mean, but he's got to be wondering what the hell is going on. The phone call that never came. It wasn't that far, but it is a walk uh, back to the boarding house uh, across freeways and stuff. That, I believe we shot in the real boarding house there. I love that landlady. She's the real thing. And it's very known, the landlady has confirmed it, that a car pulled up and beeped once or twice. It was a signal to Oswald to come out. That's what we think. Tippet killing, for example, I mean, just to, it's a long story. If we assume Oswald left his rooming house about 104, 105, the commission's version gives him about a maximum of 10 minutes to walk the nine tenths of a mile to the Tippet scene near the intersection of 10th and Patton. And there were no witnesses to Oswald's route from the boarding house to Tippet. Could he have walked that distance? But no eyewitnesses was able to make one, one shooter. No eyewitness was able to make, the sh uh, certainly Lee Harvey Oswald. So they wanted to make a big deal of Oswald killing Officer Tippett because that would, of course, justify shooting the president and fearing arrest. But not one credible witness, not one credible witness has really identified Oswald as a single shooter. In fact, the only significant testimony implies two to three shooters. Some people even postulate that Tippett was one of the shooters and was, you know, I don't know. It was just... One of those things that was perhaps planned, perhaps not planned. It, it's scenery, as, as, as Fletcher said. It just takes, you off, takes your eye off the ball, which is let's stick to the main points. Get Oswald to the theater. Oswald is next seen by shoe salesman Johnny Brewer. Lurking Johnny Brewer is an interesting character because he's one of those oddballs you meet in life who I honestly did believe was, was just perhaps what he pretended to be, which was a very observant store owner. Now, why does he go to a movie theater? If he's scared and he's not sure if he's being betrayed, perhaps uh, one of two things. One is he had an original meeting place uh, set up before the assassination, or he was told to meet so-and-so. The cop cars are there before you can call for him, and you know, it, it is like uh, Costner says, uh, the Reichstag fire. We try to make it as real as possible. We certainly had enough people who had been through the experience, so we tried to stage it listening to the police, how they did it, how the hit came, the pointing from the stage. I think it's pretty close. I don't know. Of course, I wasn't there. We shot in the real theater, and we, uh, as a result of the film, we were able to uh, contribute money to restore the theater, which was a classic old repertory house. And to my knowledge, it's still standing, and uh, they're doing a great job of running it. The action outside the theater, when Oswald is arrested, we try to make it as real as possible, based on, of course, eyewitness accounts. I love uh, Gary Oldman's look as he hits the doorway, his eyes, the sense of destiny and understanding that's crawling through him. It's one of my favorite moments, uh, shot in black and white. It's almost Eisensteinian portrait of faces in slow motion. A certain type, a certain class of American male at that time. I took some of the speech from uh, uh, his real uh, speech and some from his book. Some from his book, because he wrote eloquently in his book, the last one, and some of his comments, some of my own uh, thinking. Kevin was nervous about this speech because, you know, this is the longest speech he'd ever given in movie history, he thought. Uh, longer than Donald Sutherland's speech. So, so thank God we shot it towards the end of the movie, which was uh, good so he could build to it, but he certainly knew it by the time we got there. He knew it. He had this thing down. By having it down, he was able, like Donald, to, to, to bring his uh, personality to it because he wasn't struggling with language. It's a hell of a learning job. I can tell you that although there are cuts here, 
Uh, Kevin was able to do this speech all the way through without cut several times and had it down. Treason. I fear much of what Jim said went over the heads of his audience. It was a public execution, and it was covered up by like-minded individuals in the That's Dallas the most definite thing that Jim Garrison says, and he points, and it's hardly a large conspiracy. It's a covert wing or operation done from the military or the CIA. He says it here. That's what his belief is, and it was in his books. Both times he wrote them, never came off that story. Never came off that story. So uh, there was great consistency in the man. And contrary to his many slanderers who keep saying there was this huge conspiracy, he says here it's a very disciplined group of cold warriors inside the apparatus of the CIA and, the, and, and possibly also the defense intelligence. That's what he feels. And then the rest is cover-up. Seems to me, frankly, as a citizen, that contrary to what many people believe, our government did take this country away from us. And I don't think we have the power that we had. We're all scared, we're conformists, frightened for our livings, except for the few and the very brave who are willing to go to jail, become political prisoners in a sense, like the Barrigan brothers, the Emma Goldmans, the many people who were warriors for peace in their lifetime, like Martin Luther King, John Kennedy, who died for peace, who were ridiculed for peace, who were ridiculed for understanding that the world is one world, one planet, and that we are all equal as men, and we are all men and women, we are all united. We're in this together. It's a very Jimmy Stewart moment for me, Gary Cooper. And I can't help but think of the uh, resemblances, you know, St Jimmy Stewart cracking up on the floor of the Senate, crying. It was unplanned for in the sense that uh, I think Kevin just did feel those words and emotions and let it go. It was not planned. Do not forget your dying king. I think that line was uh, un misunderstood from Tennyson, do not forget your dying king, because the liberals attacked me for saying that Kennedy was a king and that was what's wrong with the American system. But it was not intended that way at all. It was intended more in the Hamlet-like concept of we lost our leader, our father figure, which he was, and a leader of the generation, and we don't understand why. We are left in the dark, clueless, like Hamlet. And that is a vague place to operate from for a country. It's debilitating. And uh, we have the false king is Claudius on the throne is Lyndon Johnson. So uh, I think that's what Garrison's talking about. It's not about John Kennedy being a king. The uh, liberals hate Kennedy because he comes from a dynasty of wealth. But, you know, the, it's, a, it's a prejudice. Uh, Kennedy did work in spite of his wealth in the opposite direction eventually. And he understood the concept of sacrifice. And they, the Kennedy family has held to that. I think it was, you know, rather than running from the flaws of Garrison, I'm going towards him by saying, look, here's the end of the movie. I'm putting all my weight on it. And I'm saying he lost. I'm not trying to hide anything. Garrison had a very important trial, but it was destroyed. And ultimately he lost. And I'm showing it all here. And, of course, the media hops on that and says, well, that's the justification for the Warren Commission being right, but it isn't at all. One thing it proved was that Clay Shaw was a total perjurer and was lying his way through the whole testimony. I'm going to run again, and I'm going to win. Thank you. Who do you plan to persecute? And he won uh, the third term. 30 years to nail every one of the assassins, and I will continue this investigation for 30 years. And he did in his way, in the sense that he never gave it up. He wrote that book uh, 20 years later. And by that time, uh, it was younger people that had to share the burden, carry the burden of investigation. It's a nice image of a family sticking together in defeat or victory. The government has no interest in seeing the truth come out. And that's why I dedicated this picture to the young, in hopes that there might be some energy to fix things and make things good again, or to make things better, really. That's all you can do. We brought this film together in a record amount of time. I think we finished it in late July, early August in Washington, D.C., at the bridge, at the scene with Donald Sutherland, and we went uh, to work in order to release it at Christmas. We wanted to go for Christmas. It felt right. Also, frankly, in working fast, I knew that there'd be less chance for interference, so I went for a Christmas release, and we got backed up. I mean, they were really, uh, Warners was really worried that we wouldn't get it out. We had the theaters, we had the whole campaign. It was a big cutting job, and I think uh, these guys, they all did a great job of just getting it all together at the end. And sometimes we're flying by the seat of our pants, I guarantee you. And what a cast. We were very lucky. Very rarely in our director's lifetime can you put together so many good people. It takes a certain, I think, a spirit that the material would project that people feel 
I feel part of something great. That's the best you can do, get in touch with greatness. <laughs> but I really thank all these people for doing it. Everyone, every person in this film should be proud of having been in. It was a huge uh, casting job <laughs> and a huge shooting uh, involving, but it only came in ultimately at 72 days, believe it or not. It was highly organized and we really moved fast through Dallas, New Orleans, and back to Washington. But uh, 72 days seems amazing when you hear, you see these 100-day pictures that are just about nothing. I don't care what they say. This is my godfather. <laughs> this is my godfather. I can't get any bigger than this, you know, and pull that off, all those stories. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm, you know, Nixon's godfather two for me, and uh, this is godfather one. So, you know, I feel good about it. Even if nobody uh, agrees, you know, it doesn't matter. It's what I think that matters. And I think it's just a tremendous blend of contradictory styles, which is a which is an enormous power to it, because it's like what Fitzgerald said about the sign of a true intellect or a true movie to me would be the ability to hold in its hand uh, two or more or three, four contradictory impulses. You see, there are contradictions all throughout this film. I mean, it's not a one way. If, if this was a propagandistic film, as so many critics claim, it would be boring. The fact is that the tension results from you not knowing what is going to happen next. You know, there's forces pulling against each other. You sense the forces. You don't know exactly what they are, frankly, nor do I. This Kennedy murder has become our national taboo. I pray yet for my country to return even to a fraction of the ideals in which it was birthed. I love it as much as any man. I served in its armed forces with some distinction. But that's not to say I'm a nationalist or a blind patriot, because all too often, the last refuge of the scoundrel, the man who has not served and calls on his country to, to advance his ideology, is the scoundrel. Unfortunately, the worst part in America came out in its reaction to Kennedy's murder and its desire to simplify it, to deal with good guys and bad guys and a lone gunman, John Wayne theatrics. I believe there was a deeper and significant erosion of trust in our government. On the conscious level, we moved on. We buried Oswald, we got rid of Ruby, the nightmare went away. But subconsciously, Fletcher Prouty used the word tsunami wave. The tsunami wave silently occurred and continues to roll on towards the shore. And at the beginning of this uh, new millennium, we must ask ourselves, with integrity, have we all become part of a commercial corporate state with ourselves as media-dominated consumer slaves, or are we still a true democracy where in private conscience and individual actions still matter? I said at the time that the Warren Commission from beginning to end was a myth. I still believe so. And I believe that JFK, the movie, was made as counter-myth, which I believe truly represents the inner spiritual meaning of this assassination. Only in the 21st century, I think, will historians catch up to what we have tried to obscure. And they will point their fingers at us as a society of consent, fear, and mediocrity in this matter. But more tragically, they will point to John Kennedy's death as a key moment and not a ridiculous footnote in American history. A quote from one of our American poets from Michigan, Theodore Retke, in a dark time, the eye begins to see 